All right. I've been wanting to do this just to, I'm going to do this with all of my threads, um, just kind of in, to preempt anything happening to my account, whether it's being banned or me leaving or anything like that. I just wanted to document my threads, some of them at least, um, and do it in kind of a video format. And I'm also doing it on Spaces here for some of you live. So if you're listening in, that's awesome. But this will probably be uh, better to watch on review as a visual because I'll be pointing to things and showing, showing some uh, scriptures and uh, reading them and some pictures. So just keep that in mind. But here we go. So we're going to go over my Daniel 7 thread and kind of its application to the latter days and also just an, an expounding on it just in general to understand the prophecy that's being told here, um, what it's about and where to go. So to navigate to my threads, if you go to my pinned tweet, you click on that top one uh, down below it, there's a threads post and then underneath it are linked all some topics for all of my various threads and things that I find are interesting or that I uh, frequently refer back to or link. So in my visions and dreams uh, pin I've got a thread down at the bottom right here on Daniel 7. So we're going to start. I'm going to read it. Uh, if you want to follow along maybe I'll retweet this right now. So if you are watching um, you can jump on it and go tweet by tweet with me to go over it. And I want to, I'm going to read through it. I'm going to read the scriptures. So it might get kind of long or whatever, but I don't care at this point. I just want to document this and I'm going to freestyle on top of it here. So the whole idea behind this is that, uh, well, it comes from, it came from me reading some Nibley, some Hugh Nibley, where he expounds on war in ancient kingdoms as a ritual act, that it was something that was uh, ritually performed, ritually done. There were rules, there were uh, reasons behind it. And ultimately, they were cosmic in nature or derived from a cosmic witness that they saw something happen. And what we call in our religion, the war on heaven, war in heaven, right? It's a, it was the first ritual separation or uh, the first ritual uh, combining of like types, essentially, was the first war in heaven, the separation from Lucifer and his followers from those faithful to Christ. So that's the first war kind of that's the pattern for all war in history throughout time and everything. Um, as we came down to earth and through the dispensations of time, and you know I like to talk about planets and how they uh, play a major role, especially in the antediluvian era, eras from Adam down to Noah and even down through the dispersion of the uh, tribes and the leaving of the ten, the ten lost tribes. Like I think there were planets that were actively involved in the catastrophes, the fantastical nature of things that were happening, and uh, they were a much bigger part of not just our reality, but they're, they're the total reason behind the symbology that we have left from those eras through the scriptures, through um, stories, fables, uh, mythologies, um, the artifacts, the temples, everything that was built, it witnesses and testifies of this stuff. So war is a ritual act of consolidation. Um, in the latter day context that I'm going to be talking about, this is really much more about um, war as a means to um, consolidate power. Okay, that's Basically, I just repeated what I said there, but that's fine. So the layer of Latter-day Kingdoms in Daniel's prophetic vision have been divided and rejoined through global conflicts that we call the major world wars, like World War One, World War Two, and soon to be World War Three, which I feel like, and I go out on a limb to say that we're already experiencing it to a large degree um, on information front, biological warfare front, and psychological. All those things are underway right now. So some of my light thoughts now are turning into some heavy thoughts, but... Uh, this is it, essentially. Okay, so behold, the enemies combined, was said in 1831, the Lord to Joseph Smith here in section 38 of the Doctrine and Covenants. We went over this already this year as we're studying it, but I'm going to read this whole section again because it's applicable here. But behold, verily, verily, I say unto you that mine eyes are upon you, and I am in your midst, and ye cannot see me. But the day soon cometh that ye shall see me, and know that I am, and the veil of darkness shall soon be rent. And he that is not purified shall not abide the day. Wherefore, gird up your loins and be prepared. Behold, the kingdom is yours, and the enemy shall not overcome. Verily I say unto you, ye are clean, but not all. And there is none else with whom I am well pleased. For all flesh is corrupted before me. And here's the big kicker. And the powers of darkness prevail upon the earth, among the children of men, in the presence of all the hosts of heaven. So right now, in our state, in our world, uh, in 1831 there, 
this is the Lord telling Joseph Smith and telling all of us in the latter days that darkness prevails upon the earth. I know we have this uh, all is well in Zion attitude that no, most people are good and things are moving along like they should. Everyone has each other's interests um, in mind when they don't. The, the powers of darkness literally are in control right now. So you've got to put frame everything in that context um, when you're looking at uh, current events, what's going on in the world and what has happened or what's being told to you as history. So just know that those who are in control of all of that information for the most part um, are being controlled by darkness at the highest level. So this causes silence to reign. And all eternity is pained and the angels are waiting the great command to reap down the earth, to gather the tares that they may be burned. And behold, the enemy is combined. So again, here, 1831, the big lesson and takeaway in this scripture for the rest of this thread is that this is 200 years ago that the enemy was combined. There was a conspiracy against the purposes of the Lord, the purposes of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that it was um, all of the enemies, Satan's minions, that are trying to march towards a world domination, much like the Lord right now is seeding the earth through the Church to salt it and become uh, Zion, become the one world government of the Lord. That's the exact counteraction happening on the dark side here. And now I show unto you a mystery, a thing which is had in secret chambers, to bring to pass even your destruction in process of time, and ye knew it not. So again, this is supporting exactly what I'm saying, that most members of the church aren't aware of this, or they don't believe it to the extent that the Lord is telling Joseph Smith here 200 years ago. And now if, if they've had 200 years in our system of comfort and com uh, easy commodity and lazy learning, like, where are they at, right? That's that's the reality I'm trying to wake people up to with a lot of what I say and do and in my music and whatnot. But now I tell unto you that ye are blessed not because of your iniquity, neither your hearts of unbelief. For verily some of you are guilty before me, but I will be mercif merciful unto your weakness, therefore be ye strong. Um, I love that. Just We're all weak. We're all suckers. I'm not perfect, right? I'm just trying to figure all this out just like you guys, but I guess I can explain it here. So I got some pictures of war, World War II, the upcoming World War III, apparently. And then here's a book I just recommend. This was uh, ref uh, referenced a lot in None Dare Call It a Conspiracy by Gary Allen, which was advised the, to the membership to read by the prophet Ezra Taft Benson over the pulpit. And it's by the author Don Fotheringham, the president makers, how billionaires control U.S. and foreign uh, policy. Essentially, this documents and gives evidence and all kinds of uh, cookie crumbs and, or breadcrumbs to show you that there has been this slow march of the money players in taking over the governance of our supposedly free kingdom of the United States, right? Our constitution is being slowly usurped, and this really lays the foundation about this slow-rolling uh, timescale event. And this, this totally supports exactly what's being said here in section 38, where he's saying that it's through process of time. They want to bring to pass our destruction in process of time, that they move slowly so that it's almost indiscernible, like a predator in hunting. Um, these are these are beast kingdoms that are carnivorous and, and predators. So it's kind of funny that we're, we're bringing this analogy in that what do they do when they're stalking a prey, right? They move slowly or like a cheetah or a lion in the grass, like they'll, they'll move slowly or move when they're not looking. Um, you, it's, it's stealth. And that's exactly what they're doing to us, uh, to the children of Israel in the latter days, to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Much like in past when you have tyrannical kingdoms that are taking over and persecuting the children of God, what do they do? Well, through process of time, they enslave them. They kill their children they, through infanticide. They uh, change and corrupt their doctrines so they don't understand who they are and where they come from. This is total a pattern. And for me to suggest it today, it's crazy that people would think it's absurd, but you just don't know your history, apparently. And uh, when you start to look into history and see these patterns and how they're just blatantly in, in our faces today, it's, it's eye-opening and amazing. Strengthen my testimony. Anyways, <clears throat> anyways, my take sits on the assumption that the latter days here are from 1830 to present. So the restoration of the church um, until now. This is when you have the restoration of the ecclesiastical body or the spiritual body of the, of the Lord in the church and the priesthood ordinances and in building temples and beginning that work and the spiritual work is in full force. And th it's amazing how much it's advanced and it, it truly is a marvelous work and a wonder just to see this the spiritual side the ecclesiastical side flourish in these latter days uh just over a 200 year period it's crazy so um this these are the latter days this is my assumption this is why i'm saying and, and most prophecies in the apocrypha whether we're talking about ezra's eagle or anything in the apocrypha or any apocalyptic text text that's referring to the latter days um, there's this fractal application in prophecy where yeah it could definitely and will relate to like daniel's time 
and the latter days of the kingdom of Babylon or the kingdom of Israel or whatever it was in those times leading up to the first coming of Christ. Yes, and they do apply to that. But they also apply because it's a pattern of nature and bodies and Satan's not very original. And so he does the same thing over and over again, just on bigger scales every time. And that's what we're seeing here is the same pattern um, that did happen in the past, but it, it will be and is playing out now in these latter days, 1830 to present. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy in that regard that these uh, enlightened, self, self-claimed self enlightened, illumined ones that want to bring to pass their own prophecies and a new golden age. Like they're the ones thinking they're ushering in this millennium um, without the help of Christ, essentially. That's that's what we're up against, is dark forces that believe that kind of thing. It's the same thing as us, just tweaked just a little bit, just like Satan likes to do. He, he'll take the truth so that you feel it in your heart and you know that it's true, and then he twists the important parts that um, speak to Christ. Uh, he, he snips them right out and replaces them with himself or yourself to worship yourself. All right. The, restora- the restoration of the church didn't stop the great apostasy. This is something I had to learn for myself, especially after being a missionary and preaching the, the great apostasy and the restoration um, as the primary focus. And that's exactly what we should be doing. In fact, don't don't preach these things. Don't go and, and use Daniel 7 in prophecy or, or this, especially not this Latter-day application that I'm suggesting um, in any of your ministry out to normal people <laughs> just trying to convince them of the Book of Mormon or the gospel or the restoration or anything like that. There's no, no reason for them to be uh, jumping at this meat um, without having first gone up the ladder the same way that you have by first taking the milk, the honey, and, um, you know, going through the basics, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel before jumping into prophecy and things like this. So I, I want to make that clear that I'm not saying, like, this is how we need to be out uh, preaching the gospel. This is for my own benefit and also for the benefit of saints who I see that clearly don't understand or haven't thought about this stuff and how to put it together. Um, and I'm not saying I'm 100% right here. I'm just saying there is an overabundance of evidence, and that's why I'm presenting this. Makes sense to me, especially with the cosmic anchor that seems to support a lot of what I'm presenting. Okay, so the restoration didn't stop the great apostasy. In fact, corruption continues to roll forth, ever increasing. But what it did is it salted the earth. And then I've got a bunch of scriptures here that h- highlight that fact that in this is, this is what it is. So uh, from the same section 38 that I read before, Again, I say unto you that the enemy in the secret chambers seeketh your lives. You hear of wars in far countries, and you say that there will soon be great wars in far countries, but ye know not the hearts of men in your own land. Again, all is well in Zion, but no, no, we don't have corruption. There's no conspiracy happening, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's, it's stupid and ignorant to say that, especially as a Latter-day Saint, and it riles up the fire inside me when I hear people say that. Or, you think there's a conspiracy about everything. Well, I'm, pr- I'm sorry, when I read the scriptures and I listen to modern prophets and I look at the world in that paradigm, it seems to be that they were telling the truth, not you and your all-is-well attitude. I tell you these things because of your prayers. Wherefore, treasure up wisdom in your bosoms, lest the wickedness of men reveal these things unto you by their wickedness. Meaning, don't get caught unawares of what's happening. Otherwise, you will. These wicked people are going to spring their wicked plans on you, and you'll be like, oh, they were wicked. They, the conspiracy theorists were right. There's a lot of that going on right now because people are waking up a little too late. Or they're jumping into this, this conspiracy game right now in 2020, 2021, when you've got the biggest disinformation, misinformation, and polarizing, demoralizing campaigns ever to have happened publicly, now in an internet-filled world, flooding your mind, Okay. Like, it would have been good to get on this bus a little bit earlier. And I know a lot of you couldn't or didn't or can't, and that's fine. But do not claw down people that are ahead of you in the ladder or in their awareness of what's going on, especially if they've done their research and you have no idea what they're talking about. Maybe maybe study it. some of what the prophets have said, especially Ezra Taft Benson. Everyone ignores him, and I hate it. Okay. In a manner in which shall speak in your ears with a voice of loud thunder. Yes, yeah, so this wickedness... Don't let them reveal it by their wickedness that will speak to you in a manner which shall be like the voice of uh, louder than that which shall shake the earth. But if you are prepared, you shall not fear. So there's the win. There's how you get over it is you prepare, you look at it, you (laughs) follow the prophets and do what they say. And that you might escape the power of the enemy and be gathered unto me in righteous, a people without spot and blameless. Here's another scripture in Doctrine and Covenants 101. Men are called unto mine everlasting gospel and covenant with an everlasting covenant. They are accounted as the salt of the earth and the savor of men. They are called to be the savor of men. Therefore, if the salt of the earth lose its savor, behold, it is thenceforth good for nothing, only to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. 
So if you're not keeping your covenants, if you're not doing what the prophet said, if you're not seeking to know more and to pull it all together and to lift up your brother and to warn your neighbor about what's going on, then yeah, you're a salt with no flavor. You're a sports bro who knows a a ton about the statistics of the Utah Jazz and good on you, right? I used to be there 15 years ago when I wrote for their Phoenix Suns blog. So I understand. I understand the allure of it, but wake up. We don't have time. You don't have time anymore. Things are accelerating rapidly and the prophets are even saying it. We're at a crossroads, right? That's what they say. You will not survive what's coming spiritually. That was three years ago, four years ago that he said that, okay? And, and, and still, people are choosing to put more time into sports, popular media, and all of these other time wasters instead of really bucking down and learning these things or doing the hard spiritual work that we've all been putting off because we think, oh, the second coming will come at a, lo- a much later time. Well, maybe your freedom to access information will soon be restricted if things continue to rapidly decline in our governments around the world, right? Consider that. And I am bringing this up because I'm now having to my memory, what was it, uh, before the symbol, so was it 2019, October 2019, um, President Russell M. Nelson said, imagine, like, if all of your knowledge about the Book of Mormon would be suddenly taken from you, how would that affect your life, right? He's starting to use language about the cutoff that there will be a cutoff between those who obey and keep their covenants and those who don't. Those who have studied and done the work and filled your heart with the gospel and with your covenants and those who have not and who will be blown to and fro with every wind of doctrine of man that's coming out now. Like I'm a queer Latter-day Saint book or something that just came out. It's hot on the press, right? Oh yeah, we'll love our neighbor more than God. That's exactly the winds of doctrine and philosophies of men that are shaking shallow saints from their roots right now. Matthew 5, going in. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You're the light of the world. A city that is on a hill cannot be hid. This is obvious. I mean, this is what we're talking about. We've got to stand up um, for what's right. Last scripture um, with regards to salt, going in Leviticus. Okay, so this is just pointing out the symbolic nature of that salt was even used in ancient Israel with all of their offerings. In thir- verse 13, Leviticus 2. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. So again, this memory of uh, this imagery that we are to be the salt and preserve the earth, uh, to be the Lord's chosen, to give it savor, to preserve it, much like Abraham and Lot and the few that were with them coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? How, How often did Abraham pray to say, let me just find some more people to save before you destroy it all? We're, we, as the members of the church who keep our covenants, are essentially the Abrahams of a worldwide Sodom and Gomorrah that is ripe for destruction. I say, give a reread to section one of Doctrine and Covenants. And what's the tone? The answer that I'm looking for is, it's apocalyptic. It's a, whoa, whoa, here I come, here comes destruction. My sword is bathed in heaven and my anger is kindled against you. Um, it's, it's a loud cry. If you, didn't get, if you didn't feel the righteous indignation of the Lord and the warning of destruction at the hands of his destroying angels, then you missed it. His mercy and love are also expressed in his restoration of his church, which comes later in this passage, right, where he, he softens the blow a bit with, hey, I've got salt of the earth. I've got this rock cut forth without hands that can be your protection if you would but sit under the pavilion of righteousness. That's what he says and invites us here. But first, don't ignore that he's, he's literally saying, here I go, and my anger of the Lord is kindled, or, and the anger of the Lord is kindled, and his sword is bathed in heaven, and it shall fall upon the inhabitants of the earth, and the arm of the Lord shall be revealed. These are all co- this is cosmic language to me. Okay, the sword bathed in heaven. I know I've linked it before, but uh, comets and all kinds of moving planetary bodies—they look like swords with their cometary tail and comas and everything else going on. Uh, they look like uh, swords, dragons, snakes, all kinds of things that are described symbolically uh, in heaven. So his, 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 uh, his powers of changing the earth and destroying the wicked are bathed and coming to us on heaven. So his arm is going to be revealed. That's another cosmic word for when a planet's moving, it looks like the arm of the Lord, right? Uh, sometimes it looks like it has a sword in its hand, even just in the, the patterns and gas and dusts and things that are uh, disturbed as giant planets move. But anyways, this also is just his strength, right? His, his power, his gospel coming forth, showing uh, that, it, that it's true, right? Look at how the church has grown. This is his arm of the Lord that he has done a great and marvelous work spiritually as well, not just the planet stuff, but in all of it. Everything that he has done, he has prepared meticulously for this day. And in fact, every prophet leading up to this dispensation look forward to our time. This is a great work. And we're going to see some quotes from Joseph Smith expressing that same idea that, man, we have a lot to do in this dispensation and it's really important. And a lot of us are treating it like it's no big deal. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's missing the mark. 
And the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither his, the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. This is going right back to that President uh, Nelson kind of hint. When he gave the entire church, a, that's what it was. It was the talk where he gave a, a Temple Recommend interview, basically, with some of the changes there. But then in that same talk, uh, he's sitting there saying, how would your life change if suddenly this information was taken from you, if you were cut off? right? If you were suddenly cut off from among the people, this is coming and it's literal. This is the separating of the the wheat from the tares. For they have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant. I know online, I see it on Twitter all the time. Like how many people are just so confused in the the basic doctrines of the plan of salvation or in the divinity of man and wife, right? This this is so confused that so many have strayed from the ordinances and broken the the covenant. They They don't understand it. So how can they keep it? They seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol, which waxeth old and shall perish in Babylon, even Babylon the great, which shall fall, right? So this plays into what we're going to talk or what I'm talking about in this um, thread and here in this rant that we are under the control of a spiritual mystery Babylon. Um, They are also now a temporal force that controls the governments of the world. But this is it. This is the Babylon the Great, which shall fall. So at a future date. And this is all of what Daniel 7 is about. The fall of the, those kingdoms and the coming of Adam to Adam and Diamond and the return and the, and the Zionification of America. All right. The latter days are unlike any other dispensation. We have to compound ritual patterns and overlay them across a shorter time frame compared to previous dispensations. So there's a lot to unpack in that. Um, basically, every dispensation has kind of a pattern. Every... Uh, Every person who seeks to be like Christ is going to live a pattern life. There's a template, right? There are certain things you have to do, certain tasks you have to, to, to carry out. We see these same patterns echoed in the greater picture in scriptures, like the story of the scattering and gathering of Israel or the pride cycle. It's the same pattern of obedience to pride, to apostasy, to restoration um, that we see throughout. These bigger patterns, they have to or they do manifest in each of these dispensations under their unique conditions as the world continues to decline in its spiritual state. We're in the lowest state the earth has been in, um, and I'm speaking temporally, like physically, the earth has fallen from a higher state, a higher spiritual, electrical, mental, um, psychological state. Everything has fallen. So these patterns that are happening now in the last days we have less time to fill them out. And Joseph Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith, they support me uh, kind of in this idea that I'm presenting here, but we have to help bring all these things together to fulfill every prophecy uttered um, in the spirit by the prophets. So we've got to play our part. We've got to be those servants willing to exercise the Lord's will. Joseph said, this is a quote from Wilford Woodruff uh, referring to Joseph Smith. Joseph said, I will tell you, Brother Woodruff, every dispensation that has had the priesthood on the earth and has gone into the celestial kingdom has had a certain amount of work to do to prepare to go to the earth with the Savior when he goes to reign on the earth. So he's talking about the millennium. So they, everybody in each dispensation prior has had a lot of work to do um, to prepare to meet the Savior at the second coming and to start the millennium. Each dispensation has had ample time to do his work. We have not. We are the last dispensation and so much work has to be done and we need to be in a hurry in order to accomplish it. Of course, that was satisfactory, but it was new doctrine to me is what Wilford Woodruff says. So Joseph's sitting here saying, we've got a lot of work to do, more more things that other dispensations had a longer time to kind of see play out and get in order. Uh, We've got to do it much more rapidly. And I believe it's because, uh, I mean, of the wickedness that is expanding so rapidly. Um, We are at a time in the latter days where you have world powers that are genuinely worldwide again, much like before the flood. That's exactly what happened. It's the same pattern before, like from Adam to Noah. We're at that same Adam to Noah pattern, but from uh, Seth or Melchizedek to uh, Joseph Smith, essentially, who was the Noah before our day to set up the ark of all the covenants that we have now. And we've just kind of got to stay in that boat with the prophets. Okay, Joseph Fielding Smith also says, I maintain that there had been no, had there been no restoration of the gospel and no organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there would have been no radio, there would have been no airplane, there would have not been the wonderful discoveries in medicine, chemistry, electricity, and many other things wherein the world has been benefited by such discoveries. Under such conditions, these blessings would have been withheld. For they belong to the dispensation of the fullness of times of which the restoration of the gospel and the organization of the church constitute the central point from which radiates the spirit of the Lord throughout the world. 
big run on sentence. Um, I'm a big fan of those kind of sentences, though. As many of you who follow me probably know. But there's a lot crammed in there that uh, really was the pouring out of light with the restoration to the world. The Industrial Revolution, everything else just blossomed and exploded. And the occult forces lying in wait, too, to set up their own Atlantis or Zion here upon the American continent um, – have been taking full advantage of it and choke pointing all of those technologies and control systems for resources um, and energy and money. Those are their main ways that they can constrict the power and flow uh, to the, of, of people to have their will exercised and for them, a small group, to exercise their will over the people to enact kind of their own golden age or millennium already where they're feeding off of our work. We are the slaves under their um, Babylon system, essentially. So in scriptures, too, that talk about the rising up of the slaves and things, I look at it in that context, not strictly the north and south of the Civil War conflict um, of the slavery here in America specifically, but in the bigger context of the captivity that we are currently in by a mystery Babylon. Next picture uh, just talks about the, the different dispensations. If you're unfamiliar with them, you probably shouldn't be listening to this, but this is a foundational thing. Um, we believe in, especially in the church, where we've got seven dispensation heads, 7,000 years of history, and each prophet is basically a restorative proce- prophet, um, or in Enoch's case, an, uh, a, an exalting prophet. But there's, there, uh, here, here they're listed. I'm not going to go into this one. You can read it for progeny. All right, and then one last quote from section 138 the prophet elijah was to plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to their fathers foreshadowing the great work to be done in the temples of the lord in the dispensation of the fullness of times for the redemption of the dead and the sealing of the children to their parents lest the whole earth be smitten with the curse and utterly wasted at his coming so the temple works very important everybody saw it looking forward to it i also like to talk about the spirit of elijah not just being um, this restoration of temple work and to complete these unique ordinances for everybody going back to Adam, which is a part of our work and part of the work we'll be doing in the millennium, but also the restoration of the ideas and beliefs and things that were understood by people in Elijah's time, by the saints um, looking forward to the first coming of Christ and and beyond. Like, we, it's not enough just to remember that they existed and to do their work for them, but we need to put understand their context. This is a problem we see in our modern society with the adaptation of, you know, critical theories and um, presentism, right? Where you're judging the past based on ideologies and, and, and perceived moralities of the present, right? It doesn't work, especially not if you're trying to, to capture the spirit of Elijah. You've got to see everybody in their context, in what their world was, because they lived in very different worlds. And so well, who, is, who are you to judge them for anything they did, uh, especially— the more I learn about ancient Israel and the Exodus and their their pride cycles that they went to, the more empathy I have because I see the parallels in modern Latter Day Saints and in my own life for doing the exact same thing. So, like, who am I to point a finger of scorn at? Oh, how dumb were they when they had Moses right there and all those miracles that they uh, just weren't more obedient? Because we have the same thing if we would but open our eyes to the miracles and the amazing work that is unfolding before our eyes. Okay. I mentioned all this to qualify a Latter-day Saint application of Daniel 7. And what I'm doing is exactly what, like, in the 90s and when I was growing up, all of my institute seminary instructors were like, don't do this. It's just speculation. We don't know, blah, blah, blah. But I believe things have happened here, especially with Ezra's eagle coming more of a, a, a prophecy that can be understood or put into a place that – it's becoming apparent that there's an, a latter-day iteration of this this same prophecy that's unfolding um, to bring about the physical kingdom of God, which, which is the man-child of Revelation 12, which is what um, Joseph Smith and the Council of 50 were originally looking to set up and what Brigham Young was trying to do in escaping the United States government and running west originally. Like, there's this, there's this bigger plan, guys, that when the Lord comes and Adam on Diamond is, is happening and things, he's got to take up a throne, a kingdom, as a king. We've got to lay the foundations for a real government, the government of God. And everybody who hates politics and government, like you're missing a large swath of prophecy and the scriptures because the Lord, and, and this is what Daniel's amazing, like the whole book of Daniel, right? It's it, a testament to this because Daniel is a statesman. Daniel was a political prisoner and he was able to live the gospel in that captivity to be an example where every chapter in Daniel's a banger, man, they're, they're, there's stories that you know as a kid, like Daniel in the lion's den, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the, and the flames, and the fire, and the oven, and um, all the visions of, and interpretations. Like, Daniel's, Daniel's a, a, the man, and he was a statesman. And the entire book of Daniel is really this idea of um, that God is not just a God of the political Israel. 
of the of of Jacob and of Abraham's children. No, but he is also moving and interested and involved in the affairs of the kingdoms of the world. And he will, if they ask, let them know exactly what's going on, much in the case of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and others who had dreams and visions that were, you know, given to them about their dominion. So, well, their perceived dominion was the Lord's dominion. Okay, I am well aware of the popular Christian world's focal interpretation, and even ours as Latter-day Saints, if you watch like Old Testament videos um, from BYU or whatever where they're talking about Daniel, this is, this is the staple interpretation of... Um, um, of Daniel, where you have ancient Babylon as the first beast, the lion, you have Medo Persian Empire as the bear, Greece, and uh, Alexander the Great as the leopard, and then the Roman Empire as the ferocious beast and everything in the, in the fourth kingdom. And then it, Rome's divided, the fall of that. And, and then they drag it out 2,000 years here to the latter days until final judgment and the return of Christ's kingdom and stuff. This is the modern Christian's world look at it. And this is true. Like this is happening, and that happened. I'm not refuting this. I'm saying I'm aware of this. I am talking of a post-1820 fulfillment, a latter-day shadow or archetype or echo, right? That's fulfilling the same thing. And um, so, oh, and, and it's, it's, I didn't point it out in my thread, but it's pertinent here as you see the, the heaven man here. Daniel 2 does, it's, it's basically a mirror image of this same timeline or pattern of history, um, but it's in the figure of a man standing on the earth and uh made up of different metals and in the more esoteric things that i like to talk to these are the ages the golden age silver age bronze age um iron age and then iron and clay being our most fallen state but if you look at it as a literal fall from a paradisical state of the earth from adam to noah when the golden age of saturnalia right when saturn was the first sun when this would be the, the age of kolob um, in my paradigm right this is the golden age that all of the kingdoms after the flood looked back and aspired to this is what we have in the Pearl of Great Price when you think of um, Ham in Egypt, right? Noah's son who goes to settle Egypt and who had broken the covenant was cursed, right? They, they weren't allowed to have the priesthood, yet they yearned to, to imitate it, to copy what was had before with the great patriarchs. So they were trying to imitate this golden age before of um, knowledge, philosophy, of religion and governance and all of those, the proper ritual and ordinance, um, but without the authority. And this is kind of the giant conflict and schism throughout time is you have the apostate versions of good things that muddle the, the water uh, or muddy the water for everyone else to kind of understand what's going on. They want to find the truth and there are bits and pieces of it here, but it's so intermingled with the philosophies of men that they don't know where to find the real truth. And that's the whole point of us putting our light up on a hill and preaching the gospel and being the Lord's servants and mouthpieces. Like we've got to spread the gospel and show them the evidence, show them the book of Mormon, show them the stick of Joseph that we have, right? That it's it's happening like it's, it's all it's it's so amazing okay i digress so i'm talking about a latter-day application we'll jump into it i've been recording already for 30 minutes this is gonna be like four hours it's gonna be great all right okay and then i do have a side note i guess i do go into some of the cosmic aspect of the heaven man so this this image that i'm showing you of daniel 2 the daniel 2 um, heaven man um it's archetypal of what I like to call the heaven man or the Saturn polar configuration where you had planets stacked on the north of our um, of earth right and there was an axis moon day or like a plasma stream or light or river or water or whatever you know there's so many names that it was called a tree this is the tree of life that stood before the flood um, this was the cause of the flood when this thing separated and the, the star that was in the lead here uh, Saturn discharged its atmosphere had to normalize as we were captured Go figure. Here we have the planets also following the same pattern of scattering and gathering and things like that. It's it's all there. I have another video where I go over Second Peter chapter three, the entire chapter in this cosmic view, and I explain this a lot more. Um, you you can find that um, in my threads. Maybe I'll link it sometime. Actually, I don't have it on my normal YouTube channel, so maybe I'll have to uh, copy it over or upload it to my personal YouTube channel, so that's there as well. But I go. I, I mean, if you if you hang with me, you'll you'll learn more about this, but. You had all these pillar gods of ancient antiquity, even before um, the Babylonian structures were in place or the governments were in, were in place with ancient Egypt and um, Assyria. And here you have Babylonian pillar god that looks exactly the same. Or even uh, the Greeks later, they still had Atlas imitating the same symbolism and imagery, hearkening back to the golden age that all their mystery schools and, and sorcerers and philosophers were trying to recreate for the worldly kings, the fallen kings. Yeah, and this is the symbolism of the arms upraised as well, like the heaven man. That's why all of the ancient prayers and, and why we know in our temples and things certain prayers are to be made with arms upraised. 
All right, DNC 87 teaches us that the American Civil War, and here's another big um, node and reason why I feel comfortable speculating about a Latter-day uh, Kingdom in this regard. Remembering that this whole thing is, is started in the context of that war is a ritual consolidation. It's a ritual um, act, especially by those in, in control who know what they're doing. When you study conspiracy and banking especially, and you look at who financed even World War II and World War I and things like that, the, the private central, uh, central banking system that is basically the funding arm of Babylon, um, they play both sides of the war, okay? They plan this. They, they know who's going to win before it starts, and it's a strategic maneuver to move money, to move people, to move borders, to move resources, to change kingdoms, to um, exert dominance strategically, okay? There are many reasons to go to war, and it's not always just bloodshed like the Lamanites in the early days of the Book of Mormon where they were just had this hatred to kill. I mean, there are, there are always ulterior motives for those that are manipulating others in, in injustice and in um, wickedness. Okay, moving on, what I say here? Okay, so this is a data point where it helps me to um, put a bead on this latter-day interpretation. So it's from this point that we'll look for the modern global application of Daniel 7 is from when the civil wars kind of start. But I want to read this in Doctrine and Covenants 87. It says, Verily, thus saith the Lord concerning the wars that will shortly come to pass, beginning at the rebellion of South Carolina, which will eventually terminate in the death and misery of many souls. And the time will come that war will be poured out upon all nations beginning at this place. And behold, the southern states shall be divided against the northern, and the southern states will call on other nations, even the na great nation of, Brit uh, of Great Britain, um, as it is called, and they shall also call upon other nations in order to defend themselves against other nations, and then war shall be poured out upon all nations. So uh, I know you guys have probably studied this. You understand Joseph Smith did predict the Civil War. It did happen according to, as it's saying there. Uh, but what I'm saying is that this is a trigger point as well for the future world wars. It's no coincidence that all of our global conflicts are named world wars after the Civil War takes place. Um, and, and it makes sense when you put this Daniel 7 uh, lens on everything. So I want to read this. It shall come to pass after many days. Oh, this is where I, I had mentioned before about the slaves. And it shall come to pass after many days. I think that's a key uh, phrase there, after many days. Slaves shall rise up against their masters who shall be marshaled and disciplined for war. Now, that didn't quite happen to the Civil War to the extent that I'm comfortable with, like, just accepting as, oh, yeah, that's fulfilled. I think all of this is an echo to be filled again. Even the division within the states here, in Ezra's Eagle Prophecy, the final two... Um, short feathers that are to take up before the entire eagle is burned, before all of America receives the judgment, um, they do divide up into northern and southern states again out on the eastern coast. So it's I'll be curious to see if this plays out again, not just through the Civil War, as predicted, but also in the um, opening of the final fourth beast kingdom of the devil, which I feel like we are at the cusp of seeing. So I believe we could be identified here. We can place ourselves as the slaves under a mystery Babylon of control and lies and deception and corruption. And we right now, there's kind of this revolution, awake, an awakening happening, a great awakening again, where you have um, a lot of the conspiracy theorists for the last long time are being proven correct as the world governments collude essentially to place a globalistic view and rule on everyone through coercion, through force, and it looks like through last year, through bioweapons. Like it's... It's getting to that point where it'll become kinetic soon enough, just as prophecies and the Lord has said it will. So I really hope this is happening, and I really do hope that our leaders or our masters are marshaled and disciplined for the things and crimes against humanity that they've, uh, that they've in, in, incurred upon us. And it shall come to pass also that the remnants who are left upon the land, this is a key word too, those who are left. When you read in Ezra, the second Ezra, the apocryphal book that has the Ezra's Eagle prophecy, read all the chapters. Don't just read Ezra's 11 and 12. That's lazy. Read them all. There are seven visions in Ezra and second Ezra that are all related. They're all related to the same thing, and they support a view that Ezra's Eagle is real and that it applies to all of these other scriptures that are pointing to the latter days and the kingdoms of the devil. Like it is, it is super naive, and I've seen so many videos on YouTube, and this is why I think I'm ranting on this so long, that are trying to debunk Ezra's Eagle without a clear knowledge of it themselves. It's clear they haven't read it or understood it or tried with an eye of faith to try and uh, understand it in the, in the spirit of prophecy. And when I say that, I mean considering all prophecy, that they all kind of fit together as a jigsaw puzzle, right? It's got to fit there somewhere. It's not just completely bunk, especially with how specific and how many data points match up to a modern-day interpretation of Ezra Eagle. So that's a part. The Ezra Eagle really gives me more confidence in terms of 
putting this Latter-day interpretation of Daniel 7 um, in this context of modern nations. So, it shall come to pass that the remnants who are left of the land will marshal themselves. This is what I believe will happen when, uh, like everybody, like Adam and, and most people in Desna and things, we want to get Zion going, right? I feel like this marshal themselves portion is really when that's going to start to manifest. We are still working on becoming spiritually or purified in, this, in, in heart um, to prove that we're worthy to be those who are left behind. Because in, uh, in second Ezra, the Lord tells Ezra, or it's the angel, I think it's Uriel, the angel who's visiting and giving him the visions, tells him that those who are left behind on the land that don't perish in the wars and things like that, it may seem like they are cursed because they have to go through and see some, some terrifying things. But the angel tells Ezra, no, they are more blessed because they are, were counted worthy. These people are going to be given great power to exceedingly vex or become exceedingly angry and vex the Gentiles with a sort of vexation. This is all wrapped in the ending of the time of the Gentiles and the moving of the cleansing of America, essentially, um, and becoming a Zion uh, polarized earth where you have one continent totally living a celestial paradisical type of existence. And the other side, uh, with the exception of Jerusalem, will be totally under the power of the devil and Babylon. And that's where the majority of the tribulations and the scary things that we don't want to think about, a lot of them will happen, I believe, um, during that time period after judgment here on America has taken place. That's not to poo-poo or, or, or make small any of the scary things that are here happening right now on our lands or that are about to be upon us. I'm saying look forward with your chin up is all I'm saying, that there are so many blessings wrapped in these scriptures for the faithful and for those of uh, those those who choose to keep their covenants and seek priesthood power. Um, we're going to have a good time. We'll have lots of opportunities to help and bless and heal and testify of the Lord. So, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed, I'm continuing in DNC 87 uh, verse 6, and thus with the sword and by bloodshed, the inhabitants of the earth shall mourn and with famine and plague and earthquake and the thunder of heaven and with fierce and vivid light lightning also shall the inhabitants of the earth be made to feel the wrath and indignation and chastening hand of, of an almighty God until the consumption decreed hath made a full end of all nations. Sorry, I can't read. Um, and here we have, again, this language, a, 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 an end of all nations, okay? So this plays into Daniel 7 in that th he's talking about the literal kingdoms of, of the earth, of the worldly um, sphere of things, okay? So this chastening hand is going to come down. And again, there's a lot of cosmic language that I underlined here with thunder in heaven, fierce and vivid lightning. Um, you know, you know, if you know, if you know. That the cry of the saints and the blood of the saints shall cease to come upon the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth from the earth to be avenged of their enemies. Wherefore, stand ye in holy places and be not moved until the day of the Lord come and behold, it cometh quickly, saith the Lord. Amen. How many times have we heard that? How many times have you been compelled to think about that recently, especially with the language of our current prophet and um, the loss of the temples recently and the inability to go to those holy places and the inward turn and focus of the church to a home-centered, you know, holy place-centered <laughs> church uh, th this to me, is the, the evidence is before you that this is happening, that we are preparing and maneuvering as a ship, as a body, as an ark, as a stone rolling forth without hands. We are maneuvering for this heavier part of uh, the work, this great and marvelous work. So these are all people want to ask, like, what's the timeline, Leland? What do you think? What are your exact dates and predictions? I don't do that. I'm looking at these signs. And because I have such a cosmic perspective of things, I will not be easily moved until I see things in heaven that I know need, I need to see. That's how I'm not going to be deceived by the Jesus in the caves or the Jesus in the underground bunkers or um, the white boy summer Jesus who says he's discovered in Antarctica. No, I, I'm not going there. <laughs> not until I see the cosmic things that I know must happen before He's going to come in the clouds, guys. Don't be deceived. Okay. Uh, section 130, going on the same idea here. I prophesy, oh, this is just more um, civil war prophecy. It says, I prophesy in the name of the Lord God that the commencement of the difficulties which ca shall cause much bl bloodshed previous to the coming of the Son of Man will be in South Carolina. It may probably arise to the slave question. This is a voice declared to me while I was praying earnestly on the subject, December 25th, 1832. This is, again, interesting in context of my uh, expanded idea of the slave I, um, mention here in the scriptures. Through all of these wars, there's these racial tensions that are used as kind of the whipping boy for um, conflict, right? Even this American Civil War, though it was basked in this idea of a racial conflict and divide of slavery and um, that uh, racial liberation, 
there were some very nefarious backdoor moves going on by a, a the those who are interested in a central banking system to have this implemented. So when you really look at the numbers and the funding of the war and what was going on in the Civil War, it wasn't precisely a, a, about commerce and slavery and livelihoods in that regard as much as it was about this secret combination uh, that had has existed right for a long time. That's that's the remnants of this Roman Empire that fell right. These this same mystery Babylon that is looking to usurp power over all nations. It is the one that, um, I just lost my train of thought, but it's the one, <laughs> it's the one, uh, what, what was I saying? It's the one that wants to take control through financial means, and they will stop at nothing to demoralize the nation and to incite division from within. And the race, the racial card is, is the easiest one, especially when you have these nations that are, are, slated as melting pots like Europe was and look at the European look at look at what the EU and the UN have done to um, done with the, their immigration over policying right and the forcing of cultures and things to mix and meld so that there are manufactured racial tensions it's it's in it's intentional is what I'm saying and it's not a new thing this is ancient it's an ancient ritual and I don't understand how people won't put this in the context of history just because it's we're living it, just because we're seeing the slow arms of the Hydra tentacle move and make bigger moves at consolidating their power, and we are pretty much helpless to do anything. And this is why we do need to pray and cry unto the Lord for deliverance from these, these evil secret combinations. And we need to do our part into unraveling them and shouting from the rooftops what, what we know. Um, all right, I'm not going to read the rest of that. I'm going to move on because this is getting long. Okay, next post in the thread. So in the Civil War, who did the South turn to? Well, they did turn to Great Britain, just as the scripture said. And they turned to other nations in the East um, for support. And they, they received it for the most part. I think there were some moves that stopped them. Um, but the first beast is an earth persecuting power. Okay, just like Babylon of the ancient world was this all-encompassing force that was rising to be the world. I'm doing these small air quote, quotes. This small world dominant force of ancient times. Right. Well, it doesn't take into to consideration the civilizations on the American continent to make a totality of control. It wasn't. It was a smaller iteration of this um, control mechanism. So we are living in the days right now in an interconnected global society where these patterns are manifesting, but for a total global control, not just a portion of the Eastern Hemisphere control. Uh, but this is why I believe a Latter-day application is so warranted and welcomed and easily placed, especially when you look at the symbologies here that I've posted. So you have the first beast is an earth-persecuting power. Uh, when we read in Daniel 7, let me read this, this in verse 4 in Daniel 7, finally getting into it. Wow, after an hour of lead-in. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Oh, those eagle's wings are going to come in handy. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. So this, the, the, the king of the jungle, right? The king of the carnivorous animal predator sphere, the lion, a prestigious golden era type um, dominance that they had for so long. This hegemony of not just political power, but spiritual power as well with the holy you know, Roman cross being this giant amalgamation moving forward and conquering the earth. Okay, enough of that. But this is, this is pertinent, and I think I say it in here that uh, see Ezra's eagle prophecy for these these eagle wings that are plucked, right? And it's just like the the uh, dec you know the the colonists, the those who escaped essentially um, British rule for seeking a a Zion place. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for spiritual liberation so that they could study and read the Bible and practice according to their own accord without this dominating and oppressive force um, on them. So we'll get into that later if we have time. I might stop and totally do another. Uh, Another one on, we'll read Ezra's Eagle. I'd like to do that and, sh and give you my take and then read some of the prophecies that are after it that pertain to the 10 tribes as well as to Asia and what's going on right now with China. I believe that it's all there as well, that um, that we can drive much truth from what's going on uh, by under just understanding prophecy. Read these things and be familiar with them. And then as you see current events happen, all of a sudden you're reminded by the spirit that, hey, what about this scripture I read about here? How does it apply? Or can it apply or does it? And a lot of times it doesn't. But just that exercise of having that awareness to think, to measure everything against scriptures and prophecy that you're familiar with 
it brings the spirit of revelation, I mean, almost on, on command when you decide that you're going to spend your energy and time and spirit doing that. It's amazing. And I recommend looking at the world through a prophetic context. There's a reason why in the New Testament, the apostles say that like pro- the gift of prophecy should be the number one thing that we seek. Why? Because it's not just looking into the future. That's a very shallow myopic way of defining prophecy, right? We know in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, there's more to it. Joseph Smith said that any man with the pure testimony of Jesus Christ is a prophet, essentially, that the, the spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus Christ. And when you look at that in the macro sense, the biggest sense, It is all his plan. It is his gospel. It is front to end, alpha to omega, eternity to eternity. It is one eternal round. So if you know the plan, you know, you know, the, uh, the template, you have the spirit of prophecy. You're able to discern things by knowing that framework. It's important. So I think the spirit of prophecy is, uh, so important and not to predict dates or futures or to, uh, speculate wildly on so many things, although that's always a temptation and, a lot of times speculation is good when done in faith and not irresponsibly, right? I hope I'm being responsible here in explaining. I'm, that's why I'm going to these links. But I, I snapped these from, what's his name? The Prout guy, James Prout and his Last Times uh, book. Now, I like his book because it's a good blunt introduction to a lot of the events of the last days. I don't agree with him on pretty much his end view of things. I don't agree on most people though, or, or with most people's interpretations because most are leaving out the cosmic aspects of things and how quickly things can happen in an electromagnetic universe and things of those nature where there are fundamental assumptions that I operate on that are critical in terms of talking about timelines of things. So that's where I, knowing what I know and believe about the universe and how planets work and how the millennium will come upon us like a thief in the night. Um, I, I don't put dates on things and I'm not going to get into like 70 weeks and the seven, you know, I, I'm not going to do um, the breakdowns that you've seen on YouTube. This is, this is different. This is me and it's more general. And I think it's, it's better to study prophecy first in a general sense to understand the bigger picture before you want to get lost in specifics and predicting a date so that you can be more prepared or make your financial moves or whatever it is. No, just, just live every day. Like he's coming tomorrow and you're going to be fine. How many times do they have to say that before you believe it? Like, why do I have to tell you that for you to believe it? Just do it. So this is the Royal Crest of England, uh, the gate of Buckingham Palace. You got a lion. I mean, it's nice that he's standing on two feet, but also uh, often is depicted the unicorn, uh, which is also the symbol of Ephraim, if you know that. So again, a lot of Easter eggs in heraldry and these symbolisms. There's so much symbolism too to the crest and shield, this circular structure with the wings or the the crescent on the bottom of it. This is all Saturnian imagery, just revamped, redone. Like it's it is so obvious to me that this is an echo of ancient symbols, an ancient ancient claim to divine kingship because Saturn and this configuration was known. He was the king of the world. I mean, that was, he was king. Kronos, he had the crown. That's where the, the angels ascended and descended up. That's the beginning. Okay, uh, you can see the rest of these. They're documented for progeny. Great. Moving on. So going to the second beast, Daniel 7, verse 5 reads, and behold, another beast, a second like unto a bear, and it raised up itself onto one side. I like what the Institute Manual says about that, that phrasing, raising up on one side. Um, I think often you think like it's a lazy bear and he's like rolling over on one side and licking his lips or something, but that's, that's not what the Institute Manual leads you to believe that this phrasing, um, retranslated could mean that he's standing up on his two legs, like he's going to pounce or attack, which is much more, um, congruent with what it's doing here in the second half of the verse where it says, and it had three ribs in its mouth and uh, of it between the teeth of it. So it had three, three ribs in the mouth between its teeth. And they said thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. Right? So that it's, a, it's rising up and eating. That's what it is, a scary bear. What is this bear in modern times? Well, after England kind of loses power as America, the wings are plucked from it, and then it loses its trade route through India, and England as its global you know, commerce domination begins to be challenged. You have this second... Uh, beast kind of rise up to threaten world domination or to provoke the world in that regard. And here it is. Here's a cool image of the bear, the ribs. Um, Let's read this real quick, just for context. It says, during 1922, the communist Bolsheviks were victorious under Lenin's leadership and Joseph Stalin's military strategy in creating the Soviet Union, USSR, with the unification of the Russian Republic bear, and here are the three ribs, the Trans-Caucasian Republic, Rib one, Ukrainian Republic, rib two, and the Belarusian Republic, rib three. All this happened before World War II, where the bear did rise up to eat much, uh, to eat much flesh. So those are the ribs, if you would have it. Now, 
after the fall, uh, the kind of downfall or the, the Cold War and things, these nation states kind of went back to their own. Um, but this definitely, you could say, happened. And the symbolism is kind of hard to ignore when you got the Russian bear and everything standing up. So the USSR finally crumbled financially. Seems weird how finances seem to be the downfall of all these, right? So who the mystery Babylon bankers behind the scene are the ones pulling these uh, financial strings to kind of get what they want. Um, I would say, too, just as, as a side tangent, you have a modern Russian or a Syrian uh, today that is much different than this 100 years ago communist USSR bear. Um, the ideologies and the factions even within Russia are changing, much like we're seeing here in America and China and everywhere else that you look um, with with an eye outside of mainstream media, you can see that there's a clear division of ideologies, this nationalist versus the globalist type strategy where you're having pushback and the globalists aren't able to smoothly transition their machine as they'd like to. So this is where you're going to have to have um, some violence to do so, which makes sense with their prophecies and, and signing and shadowing of a World War III to be upon us soon so that they can make this new consolidation. And put down all those pesky voices of truth seekers and conspiracy theorists and religious zealots. Y'all are crazy. Okay, uh, let's finish reading this. USSR fun crumbled financially as well, mounting debt spending in its military in the 1980s crippled the USSR as it tried to keep up with the U.S. military tech spending. In 1989, the Berlin Wall in Germany was abandoned, uh, burning down this wall by the USSR military and... The people broke it down. A few years later, in 1991, the job of financial destruction was complete, and the USSR defaulted on its government bonds. The USS Empire was over, and the individual countries in Eastern Europe retook their own sovereignty. But did they? Okay. In my opinion, or it says, it is my opinion, and this is James Prout's words here, it is in my opinion that the, the Bear Empire in Daniel chapter 7 is the Russian USSR Empire from the 1940s to 1991. I don't care about the dates. Who cares? Like, they, it happened. Um, these... These, these kingdoms are in sequence, so they do stand up kind of one after the other, much like the uh, feathers in Ezra's eagle. Um, but it doesn't mean that that has to be right after the other. I mean, Alexander the Great was building his kingdom and dominating before uh, he took over the Persians, right? That's They were already a thing. They overlap in power, and so the dates don't matter to me. The fact that they happened are, is what I'm looking for, the events. The third beast, unto whom dominion was given... I claim and call it the uh, European Union. I agree with Prout here and others that European Union it fits this description exactly. And here, let's go over it. In Daniel 7, um, verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which upon the back of it, four wings of a fowl and beast, and also four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, when you listen to Prout and other people, they're like, well, I don't know what the four wings mean. I don't know what the four heads mean, blah, blah, blah. Well, if they knew cosmology and if they understood um, these, the symbolisms going back anciently and stuff, I, I believe that the four wings represent the uh, final control over the four quarters of the earth. So mobility over the entire earth was now to be exercised. And this is evident. When you look at how things were like the English kingdom, the British kingdom uh, was not necessarily a totally global power as there were still other nations, even here in the Americas and stuff, that weren't yet totally under its power. But here with the leopard, we see the first beast that truly does have this mobility, unlike any others. And uh, Greece would have been the same in this, in that um, they had a position of strategic uh, advantage, and they used it. It kind of centralized among all those ancient nation states and things. So uh, in this, I believe that the four wings and the, the four heads even represent kind of a a more macro control where you don't have one place consolidating all the power, but um, kind of a division among them. Okay, so that's where I, I think the wings of the fowl and the four, the numbers, that's how I think that are significant there in terms of that they represent kind of the four quarters of the earth or a totality of the earth in their dominance. And dominion was given to it. It's exactly what happened after World War II. The EU was formed and dominion was given unto it. And who had the most seats and biggest population there at the in the councils? It was Germany, right? The same people who said, you can't have a military. You can't do this, blah, blah, blah. And then what? Now they're the head. They've got most power. And fast forward to our times, 2020, does the UN, which it is extension basically of the EU, do they have a military? Oh, yeah. Heck, yeah. They'd like to get it everywhere and everywhere in the name of um, – you know, public interest and whatnot. But this is essentially the third beast amassing and controlling and creating its own backup army to instigate conflict. Okay. I totally believe that. I'm not being sarcastic or, you know, cheeky about it whatsoever. Like this is how the devil operates. And if you think that it's anything else, but um, a passing of hands from one beast to the next and one world dominating power right now to the other, 
there's no good guy out there in terms of this. Like there are good people within these organizations, structures, institutions that are fighting. Yes, always. Just like Daniel was in Babylon, right? And living a Christ-like life, like and receiving blessings for it and changing the world because of it. Or Joseph going into Egypt and saving whole nations because of his actions while in captivity, right? This is exactly the reason we're the salt of the earth. But we got to understand that there really is this hegemony, like this control, this dark power over the earth. Don't close your eyes to it. So Germany and France are the biggest nations here in the EU. And it's no coincidence that Germany, like their state, uh, you know, animal or whatever is the leopard, panzer. Think of their their tanks. And I think I've got some pictures of this. Right. So you have uh, three modern tanks of Germany have all been named after a pan panther or leopard. Right? You had the panzer tanks of 1937, the panther tanks of the 40s, and the leopard tanks of the late 60s. Um, their stamps, their heraldry, and even going back to 1317 AD, right, that they had a silver coin minted depicting a panther on it. So this is not something that was just made up to try and, um, you know, for me to contrive and fit this into it, like this, <laughs> these symbols and things are there and this is happening and you can either see it for what it is and put it in its place or you can ignore it and just say, oh, it's coincidence. Ooh, it's lucky, lucky guess or something. And uh, what do we have? Oh, I missed one. The Gaelic rooster for France. So this fits the language of uh, Daniel 7 here where you've got the four wings of a fowl and four heads of, um, four heads of a leopard or whatever. Um, I've got some other graphics here that depict German coin with an eagle and wings. And again, um, Holy Roman Empire kind of took the same thing. And this is where a lot of people think Ezra's eagle applies to the Holy Roman Empire. And maybe it does, right? I, I wouldn't doubt that there are par portions of it that maybe talk about that. But Ezra is explicitly asking for the interpretation when he's getting his dream. And Uriel, the angel, tells him, like, you're, you're seeing things in the latter days. This is a latter day kingdom that I'm showing you, right? Um, so this is why I treat Ezra's eagle as a purely latter day um application or you put that Ezra's eagle into the spot of the modern day Daniel 7 where the 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 wings of the eagle are or the wings of the the lion are plucked the eagle wings of the lion are plucked back in verse 5 or whatever it was okay the Gaelic rooster okay so we just have some imagery that I'm looking at here on the stamps different French um, symbolism uh, for the Gaelic rooster so that's that's interesting right hmm a lot of evidence there that suggests a lot of things lining up. So what comes next, right? Because right now the EU is alive and well. Uh, well, it's not alive. It's, I mean, it is alive, but it's not well. Um, this is, when was this? In February 2020. And around that time, you had this video I linked in the thread, uh, Nigel Farage, who is basically giving a banger speech in front of the EU, telling him that because of their corruption, because of their inability to be democratic and listen to the voices of the different nations and to just kind of run their own program, because that's what they're doing, um, they're, they're going to be withdrawing. That's what the whole Brexit was. It was an exit from the EU for his nation. So a lot of other nations are threatening that. I think I just tweeted something out recently of a based Dutch uh, parli parliamentary uh, leader who was essentially saying the same thing that Farage was saying a year ago, but now with evidence of the COVID, everything going on, the pandemic, the um, pandemic, He's just totally red-pilled in terms of this EU beast that's running its own globalist agenda and disregarding the voices of the individual nation states uh, within it. We have the same thing happening here in America with our voice in, I believe, in the election and all kinds of things going on where our representatives aren't listening to us. They, they don't have our interests in mind, and the voice of the people is not being heard as intended. So we are approaching that constitutional crisis that's been prophesied. So what comes next? Most won't like my opinions because, again, there's that that scary C word of conspiracy, right? But it, that's exactly what this is, and the scriptures are testifying to it. I don't get it. Why, why are you so hard-headed? <laughs> why? But what happened uh, was significant with the Brexit and the exiting there um, in terms of this third beast kingdom falling because what comes next? The fourth beast kingdom, which is going to be scary, and we'll go into that, but I put a side note here how in it's interesting that the a known globalist Nazi, George Soros, and I, when I say Nazi, he literally was a Nazi. He was a Jew turned Nazi to persecute his own kind and then worked his way up the ladders. Um, nasty, nasty dude. And he's totally involved in all the social engineering projects. He's the one paying the migrant caravans coming up and things like that. So uh, this guy is heavily involved in, in Babylon, right? And he's likening the coming collapse of the EU to the second beast kingdom. So that's kind of very curious to me where he says the EU could collapse in the same way the Soviet Union did. So he's, he's, he knows that this is their power structure that they're utilizing, essentially. He knows that what comes next is something that they're planning for. So are you listening? 
If you're apathetic towards politics, then you're never going to fully use, utilize the scriptures. And I can say that categorically. Yeah, you're going to have great warm fuzzies and understand the normal you know, scriptures that everybody loves to quote in church. But there's like 90% of the scriptures that nobody touches or reads or brings up ever because we don't really know how to explain them or we don't understand the historical context. So we feel uncomfortable uh, broaching them, things like that. Like if, if we would apply our minds, like the Doctrine and Covenants 88 tells us to, to all things in the study of all things and, and bringing our knowledge of the restored gospel to those things that we refuse to look at, right? Well, when that happens, the spirit makes the, the synapse, the, the connection. The spirit tells us how to put them, which puzzle pieces go where, right? And I totally believe that when you look at prophecy in the context of modern politics and you with the spirit and with a faithful eye, right? An eye single to the glory of God and not to be just some arbit- like a harbor of weird uh, esoteric facts like a lot of people like to accuse me of. And yeah, there's that temptation sometimes. Like I want to teach something that nobody's heard of, but I'm, I'm over that at this point. I just want to, the things that I have tried to teach, I want people to understand. I, I'm done, you know, sharing my own personal um, questions. I, there are a lot of questions that I've had and had answered that I think others could benefit from that would deepen their testimonies to withstand the winds of temptation really sweeping over the saints right now with this contention over same-sex um, issues or um, doctrinal issues with the church and leadership and um, whatever it might be, right? The jab, anything. I think those are all shallow topics. And if we would dive deeper into the scriptures, um, into these kind of things that we've kind of put off and put blindfolds over our eyes um, with, that we can we can enhance and enlarge our understanding substantially. The prophecy of Ezra's Eagle states that the secret combinations who are the puppet masters have the intent to govern the world, right? This is a global combination. This is globalism, the one world government of the Antichrist, the stark opposite or the polar opposite, like Lehi tells us, that it must needs be that there's opposition in all things and all of our scientific uh, laws, you know, that we we know work, there's an opposition in things. There's a For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is this. Just as we are trying to establish a Zion people, an integrated, inter connected people and that's the problem with america is that we've been we've been um we put it had a boot put on our head and we're stuck in independent gear right we don't want to move into that interdependence where we open up like a zion society and we're a people of one heart everybody wants to be their own self and that's exactly the doctrine of lucifer right um, unto thy own self be true so that's not that's not our our doctrine whatsoever. Ours our doctrine is unto the Lord be true, unto the will of God uh, may His will be accomplished as it is in heaven, here on earth, and through us may we be His His utensils. I highly encourage all to re, uh, to read the apocryphal prophecy of Ezra's eagle, and I, like I said it here, I'm going to commit. We'll go over it. I'll do another um, as long as it takes. We'll read it. I'll go over it and kind of interject my thoughts again, like I'm doing here, because um, I think there's much value in this, and there's much being misunderstood and put out there as like ultimate truth. Like, don't believe this. Don't believe this. And if you're, if you're trying to, you're going to go down wrong paths and be crazy. I don't buy that. I haven't changed my position on any of this stuff other than to shift it subtly for expectations. Like I figured that they would have assassinated, um, you know, certain people, but it didn't happen. They used other means to, they didn't need to, they didn't need to be so public about it. Maybe there would have been backlash, right? I, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I just assume the worst based on the attitudes of the media and people uh, in high positions of power and the things they say. Seems like we're, we're getting to that point of political violence. And it's here, next tweet. Good thing, because that's where my mind was going. Uh, oh, I'll read this because I didn't. At this point in the timeline of the Latter-day Gentile Kingdom's interpretation of Daniel that I presented, where you have England as Beast 1, USSR as Beast 2, the EU as Beast 3, and now we're awaiting the uh, arrival or essentially or re- the revealing of the Beast 3, which I believe coincides with Ezra's eagle prophecy and the unveiling of the three eagles heads who come up to snatch up who would think to be president after Joe Biden if things play out, right? So we're, we're going to see soon. We're all going to look. I don't know. I'm not making a prediction at who it is or what or where. A lot of people have tried, and I'm just anxious and interested and excited to see it play out in real life and be a part of it. So um, Next, this is a parallel in the Book of Mormon. Leading up to the destructions, calamities, and advent of the Lord in 3rd Nephi, here on this American continent, 2,000 years ago, there were murders of the leaders and conspiratorial plots in the government that unfolded and they were exposed as the Nephites collapsed, okay? 
I'm giving the TLDR, uh, the too long did not read version, but everybody should study that. Should, uh, President Ezra Taft Benson, even in his talks, highlights this as one of his main messages, that the Book of Mormon is a parallel to our last days. It was, it was compounded by Mormon, the historian, in such a way as to be a roadmap and kind of a historical pattern and things for, for how the latter days will play for us in our time. Why are we using it like that? I think that's an amazing way to use it. And there's no reason not to do that. There, it, it takes nothing away from the other treasures and joys and jewels that you found in the Book of Mormon your whole life to add another layer of amazing pre-prepared parallelism from the Lord and his prophets. It's amazing. So when America is unsettled by internal turmoil or divided, which is we see it happening all around us. You're in denial if you think it's not happening right now. The enemies from without are going to take full advantage because how many are leading, uh, awaiting uh, without our borders to jump in on us? But even like the scripture said, we know not the hearts of men within our own house. We have traitorous, treasonous, seditious men in high, in high places, wickedness in the highest of places. So from the current President Trump until Zion, or well, he's not current anymore. So the current President Biden, he's number 16, uh, until Zion comes from above, the presidents of the U.S. will be removed from office by the ploys, uh, by warring secret combinations. People don't buy that because Trump, uh, well, they don't, they don't buy that the election was, was rigged, which is ridiculous. All, all our elections have been rigged for a long time. And if you're just waking up to that and being skeptical of it now, you're too late. Like you need to, to speed up your, your learning curve. You need to get on board with the conspiracy stuff. Um, and there's, there, there's been a, a long history of this. It's not just like all of a sudden in the last few years, all these conspiracy topics have come out of the woodworks. No, these have been there. They just haven't been talked about or put together or woven together in a coherent story until now. It's happening because it's playing out before our eyes. All of these inter, inter, seemingly um, disparate things are all of a sudden showing themselves to be interconnected by wicked people in the highest places. So this is when the saints will save the Constitution as it hangs by a thread. So this is coming soon publicly, and I believe it's happening now behind the scenes. How? Well... I believe even the lowliest of saint like myself, right, that is a nobody, a Sunday school teacher, and just somebody who genuinely loves the scriptures and studies them every day, my awareness of this is contagious. I have to share it with people, and I'm learning in my own ways how to not be overbearing or how to slip it um, more tactfully in conversations with strangers or others. Um, in my online posts, I'm just kind of blatant about it because it's a, a white space to throw out my thoughts. And um, so everybody needs to decide and kind of play that game for yourself. You've got to be open to sharing these things and being persecuted for it. You're going to have family members and people call you crazy. Are you willing to, to endure that? Are you willing to shake it off and forgive them like the Lord would and continue to sound the alarm? Or are you going to shrink at the first sign of contention with somebody that you admire or love? Or are you going to shrink at the first sign of, um, you know, uh, whatever challenge you got to rise up to it. So, now is the time to educate ourselves and decipher the deception through the propaganda of media and by the power of personal revelation and the iron rod. And I think this fits again with the prophet's um, warnings just recently that we will not survive what's coming and what is happening right now without the gift of personal revelation, without knowing how to communicate with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here are some quotes now that talk about the Constitution being saved uh, by a thread. This one's um, looks like from an ensign or something. I can't remember. Dr. Michael Stewart, Brigham Young University, Department of History, says the documents show that Joseph Smith did prophesy a number of times that the United States and the Constitution would be imperiled and that the elders would have a hand in saving them. Hold on, I need to drink water. I've been talking for an hour. Is this still on? I wonder if my space is still even on. Hmm, I can't see anybody. Oh, well, I'm recording it, so you guys will get to see this later. Okay, let me start over. The documents show that Joseph Smith did prophesy a number of times that the United States and the Constitution would be imperiled and that the elders would have a hand in saving them. The first known record of the prophecy dates to July 19, 1840 in Nauvoo, when the, when the prophet spoke about the redemption of Zion using Doctrine and Covenants 101, which I've read some passages from. As a text, he said, even this nation will be on the verge of crumbling to pieces and tumbling to the ground. And when the Constitution is on the brink of ruin, this people will be the staff upon which the nations shall lean and they shall bear the Constitution away from the very verge of destruction. I think I posted on uh, Brett's post um, today. Uh, about this parallelism in Joseph Smith setting up the Church of the La Latter Days, like Joseph going into Egypt, um, and how he set up uh, his staple or his staff of survival in 
the visions and dreams and preparations that he made in conjunction with the um, with Pharaoh, right, to say literally save the lives of Jacob and the tribes. And I think at a bigger scale, we're seeing modern Joseph, whom ancient Joseph prophesied of, do the same thing with the church and that our stakes and Zion that we are building out, the infrastructure, the logistics, the uh, sense of community, the interdisciplinary nature, an integrated um, way of life that we have as Latter-day Saints, this will be the staff that will um, bear up the Constitution, not only, but also any, any of the Gentiles who choose to live a Zion-type life um, and come up to Zion. So this is definitely what I see in the works. This is this is what we're going, we are a part of right now. And the prophet is saying, how much of a part do, do you want to be? How big of a role do you want to have in what we're about to do? Because it's going to be crazy. It's going to be amazing. So here's the next quote, I think from the same article. There are also other documents in, uh, in church history files that show that five different early saints recorded some remarks to the prophet Joseph Smith on the same prophecy, perhaps voiced by the prophet on a, uh, a number of times in a number of ways after 1840. Parley P. Pratt wrote in 1841 that the prophet said, the government is fallen and needs redeeming. It is guilty of blood and cannot stand and is now, <laughs> hold on, I have to read it with the right emotion here. The government is fallen and needs redeeming. It is guilty of blood and cannot stand as it is now, but it will come so near desolation as to hang as it were by a single hair. Then the servants go to the nations of earth and gathers the strength of the Lord's house, a mighty army. And this is the redemption of Zion, when the saints shall have redeemed that government and reinstated it in all its purity and glory. This statement right here, it matches perfectly, and I'm going to pull it out, um, what Uriel the angel tells Ezra in Second Ezra about this eagle, this Ezra's eagle. Um, and I'm going to find it right here. Hold on. Bear with me. In the interpretation of the vision. Oh, that's the man breathing fire. Here we go. Where these are. Da -da -da -da. Oh, here it is. Okay. As, um, and this is Uriel saying, then after the time of that kingdom, there shall arise great strivings and it shall stand in peril of failing. Oh my gosh, the same language here that Parley P. Pratt and Joseph Smith are using. Nevertheless, it shall not then fall, but shall be restored again to its beginning. And I'm reading in the apocryphal book of second Ezra chapter 11. And this is verses 18 through 19. Um, but that's it. That, that, same language I'm re being reminded of because I had recently read both of these that Parley P. Pratt uses there. Um, okay, next quote, same publication. Orson Hyde recalled that the prophet predicted that the time would come that the Constitution and the country would be in danger of an overthrow. And said he, if the Constitution be saved at all, it will be by the elders of this church. I believe this is about the language as nearly as I can recollect. It's from the Journal of Discourses. In a Pioneer Day celebration in Ogden in 1871, Eliza R. Snow, wife of the prophet, said, I heard the prophet say, the time will come when the government of these United States will be so nearly overthrown through its corruption that the Constitution will hang, as it were, by a single hair, and the Latter-day Saints, the elders of Israel, will step forward to its rescue and save it. Are we ready to do that? Uh, okay, one more. Uh, on various occasions, Joseph Smith referred to the Constitution, the country, and destiny of the nation, and there is clear evidence that he anticipated future peril. Furthermore, he pronounced the prophecy at various times and places. Perhaps he himself interchanged the simile uh, on the brink of ruin, hang by the brittle thread or hanging by a single hair, etc., to describe the anticipated crisis. It is also clear that the redeemers or rescuers of the Constitution were to be either the saints generally or priesthood officers specifically. Since no particular time was given for fulfilling this prophecy, members of the church have often wondered about its timing. The prophecy clearly indicates a single identifiable episode yet to come. However, it is helpful for us to constantly be on guard against threats to the central elements of the Constitution. It is not wise to sit by and think that the protection of the Constitution is the problem of someone else at some other time. And what did we just have in conference from the first counselor in the uh, presidency of the church? A total talk on up this on protecting and keeping this constitution um, as a central tenet of our society here on this American continent. It's part of the covenant. It's part of this promised land that we have those types of ideas um, here. Freedom of, of religion, freedom of thought, freedom of uh, expression. All these things are important. So we must um, must be on, on, on guard here. Okay. So speaking of iron, why was I speaking of iron? Oh, uh, Revelation holding to the iron rod is what I said in the previous tweet. A good transition, Leland. So speaking of iron, let's continue in Daniel. As America is under attack and going through division, the next 
world power will wage war with iron teeth, the scripture says. So let's read it. Daniel 7, uh, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this is the fourth beast. This is what we're yet to see, we're about to see, and this is what anciently uh, could be described as Rome and um, the um, the rise of what I will call mystery Babylon and the mysticism of false priesthoods to cast a spell in the world after captivating the Christian religion. That's what uh, the Romans did. So they they meshed to the the spiritual kingdom of God that was established, and they incorporated, incorporated it into their, their final beast kingdom, their Roman beast kingdom, which I believe is symbolic to uh, the whore riding the beast in Revelation in these latter days, uh, very similar, where you have the church body riding upon the beast and being an agent of it, essentially, um, to partake in the iniquities of it, which is sad, but it's the reality. Um, and that's the need for the restoration. But here in the latter days as well, I believe there's a, a similar... Um, shadow and echo and archetype like this beast, beast kingdom that's going to come up it will also carry with it a new world religion there's not just a new world order coming but they have a new world religion and it involves transhumanism and the alien question and all of the things that you're seeing being thrown at you as propaganda because they need a way to co- to counter the the uh, imminent cosmic happenings and changes to the earth and to our psyche that are before us because as we ramp up to the millennium, the conditions on the earth are going to change. The veil between the earth and the spirit world and also the planets, the hosts of heaven, it's all going to start get mixed together. This is why you've got these uh, teasings of various technologies and space travel and aliens and, and this type of breakaway civilization talk because they are anticipating the same thing. So they're preempting it with their own narrative to continue to, to wrest control. Iron is symbolic of war. Iron is symbolic of blood. Iron is symbolic of division. Iron is symbolic of Mars. Right. And anciently, um, the descent, <clears throat> the descent of Mars on the polar column or this polar configuration of planets before the flood and, and after Mars would descend down to the earth and interact with it and cause all kinds of war and upset. And it would seem like they were throwing thunderbolts um, when the planets collided, essentially. So Mars is definitely a symbol of war. And usually when there was war in heaven, the nations of the earth, when they saw a planetary catastrophe impending, they began war themselves. So it's kind of like war on earth precedes a war in heaven because all of the kings of the earth are going to be maneuvering to expand their their reach or protect what they have. When planetary catastrophe happens, there's also a change in climate and the earth conditions. And so a lot of the ways that city building um, civilizations survive through their agriculture and things like that, they get wiped out in planetary catastrophe and you have these nations uprooted, needing to reach out and you know provide for their people. I think we can see that happening with China right now in terms of there are dramatic weather changes happening in the cycles of the sun that are leading up to what we see happening. The The globalist world, they call it global warming, right? But it's not. This is These are natural cycles of the sun when you think of an electric universe where the sun is the primary uh, instigator for climate change on the earth. It's not your cow farts, I'm sorry. So uh, I digress there. Let's move on here in the thread. So this kingdom will be diverse from all the others. It's going to be different. And it's going to bring out technologies and war machines that we have not yet seen. Just like um, just like in the past where the Romans were ruthless and had tactics and measures and things that um, basically made them so terrible. But this is going to be times a million because I believe uh, you've got anti-gravity type technology that's in the wait, lying in the wait for this type of uh, kingdom to emerge. I believe the UFO question has everything to do with the fourth beast kingdom here. I don't think it's benevolent uh, beings that are teasing us <clears throat> with signs in the sky. Not at all. In fact, the Lord doesn't do that unless it's for the wicked unto their destruction most of the time. Um, it, there's usually, if there's a sign or a signal or a vision or a dream given, there's an interpretation to follow it. And if there isn't one, you need to ask. And if you don't get one, disregard it or set it aside until one's given and provided. Don't go sharing it until you do have a, a clear interpretation from the Lord. This is a principle taught by Joseph Smith too. And, um, Even in the teachings of Joseph Smith, he talks about Daniel 7 and these images and the beasts and the kingdoms, and he gives that same warning that um, we're not responsible for visions that don't have uh, an interpretation either. So if there's some vision that was given and there's no interpretation or a meaning that we can derive from it, then we're wholly not responsible for it. And I wonder if that's almost a a mercy and a grace in our modern-day church with how many distractions we do have that the leaders of the church aren't openly expounding on these visions and prophecies because then we would be bound to obey them 
and or to act as if they were real and that would change um, the dynamic it would cause persecution because we would openly begin to push back against babylon more so than we had in the past um, but i think the the idea was to expand our tents and now we'll be raising them as the church transitions so the kingdom that emerges will be forged order out of chaos order of chow um, this is the mo for secret societies uh, for the new world order when you look into these things um and you look into the histories, read books about them. This is this is their ideology. This is um, it's a, it's a bastardization of the creative power of God, where He is creating order out of chaos. That there's chaotic matter that that gods are organizing into organized matter. And um, but the game here for these new world order schmucks is that what they do is they create the chaos so that they can recreate the order. Um, it's not necessarily the same thing. So. It's, it's a bastardization of truth that we know, uh, but this is their motto. <clears throat> so the hierarchy of mafia that run the global governance cabal through financial, military, and technological hegemony will instigate war as they are being exposed, which is currently happening. There are so many people waking up that they will need some event to brainwash society again or to cover up their, their crimes um, and atrocities. And that's what I believe all of the world wars have been, essentially. They have been maneuvers for the expansion of their central banking and military and technological control. Um, but also, they, they, everything can have multiple reason, re purposes, multiple layers, um, multiple objectives, right? And when you're dealing on global mechanisms, you always do because there's some lesser system being affected. <clears throat> so you've got to line them up. This is what's happening. They're being exposed. And so how will they cover it up just like they have before? It'll be some event, whether that's a 9-11 type event where you're literally programming the country into um, having new enemies or... Uh, and I believe it might be the UFO enemy. It might be an extraterrestrial enemy that uh, says that gives them the reasoning to say, well, this is why we've got to have a global military governor, uh, governance now and essential control because well, what if something from another planet comes and we're all divided? How are we going to fight them? Um, and, and this is what they're doing in preparation for the return of who? We know that there will be 10 tribes who return, the city of Enoch, the city of Melchizedek, and other celestial heavenly beings that will literally return to the earth and be perceived as alien. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you think that <clears throat> if an angel Moroni or Jesus came floating down like we imagine often in Third Nephi, that if somebody who had not been purified, right, like a Gentile or a Babylonian had seen what's going on there, they would say, wow, there's an alien descending from, you know, heaven. That's what I believe that they're programming and um, like uh, preconditioning us for is that type of um, event as the fourth beast kingdom, which is diverse and different, shows its power with great ferocity. So as this new world order begins to coalesce through tribulation, Daniel considers the composite kingdoms that uh, make up the power and authority of the beast, the horns. He sees the rise of a little horn or a stout horn who speaks great things and who exerts dominance. You all know this is the Antichrist. Daniel 7 verse 8 says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up one of them, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. I believe these are the three heads of the eagle that the Antichrist basically um, pits against each other and the final one he kills himself. Um, and then his two minions are taken over the government here and they get pushed out. This is, I believe, directly applies to, and if you know what I'm talking about, you're following it, it's through Ezra's Eagle. If not, wait till I, or, or go study Ezra's Eagle yourself and then come back and listen again. Um, or I'll, I'll touch on it again when I do the Ezra's Eagle thing. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things, right? So this man's going to have, um, I'm not going to go a whole lot into the Antichrist. I hate the Antichrist. Um, but it's inevitable he will be here. And I am one that believes that there is a literal Antichrist that's coming, a man, a leader who will do great things and speak, like it says, great blasphemies against Jesus, the Christianity, the Judeo-Christian way of life, um, period, and will bring magic back. Like it'll literally, he will literally bring heaven from, from or fire from heaven, um, maybe have some control over space in, in some regard or access to the science that they've been occulting, uh, plasma physics and things like that. Um, and he will deceive many. It will, it will be very convincing because I think it will have a lot of truth that has been hidden or held back. And um, Joseph, it's funny, this, I'm looking at pictures now that I have on there of the seven-headed beast where one has a wounded head and it's miraculously healed. This is all, these are all events that happen in the book of Revelation. And Joseph Smith clears things up in terms of what that beast, the seven-headed beast is versus what the beast we're talking about that are kingdoms, right? And an antichrist. That beast that has a head healed, he calls it a literal beast in the heavens. Okay, so get ready for that, whatever that means, that there's a literal beast in the heavens. I can, I like to extrapolate that in my cosmic mind as to think maybe he's talking about these stars or planets that are going to start to fall to the earth and it will look like a, a, a dragon or a monster and maybe um, the Antichrist will claim that he's the one controlling it essentially or causing it, instigating it, I don't know. 
Or maybe there is some crazy dragon that will come back, like a literal beast, a plasma creature. I know lots of uh, spiritualist New Age type mystics that preach of a plasma apocalypse, that there is a, a reoccurring plasma event that reshapes the earth um, if you know your ancient history and mythology and the writings and symbols of ancient cultures that they describe this end of the world or this apocalypse that it's a recurring event um, and plasma and monsters are involved that when the plasma starts going off and the world goes upside down things begin to float all kinds of stuff that we read in the scriptures that would match up um, to these happens happenings um, they also talk about beasts that live in the plasma or that are alive in the light that are that are permitted to come through and it makes me wonder if this isn't like the manifestation of things in the spirit world um, that come through where you have a combination of the both um, as we approach a, again a paradisical state where i believe spirits are more visible the finer things are more visible when the earth is in a paradisical state an elevated state so who knows i don't know and i'm anxious to see i'm excited to see just like everybody else what this is i have no idea right but joseph smith makes it clear that the seven-headed beast that has a wounded head and gets healed is a literal beast and um it's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith where he talks about it and expounds on it. I think I have it up here, actually. I was going to read some, but this has become so long that I'm not going to. But I can tell you what page. I think it's page 287. I don't know if these are true to the book or text or not. I have it over here, but I'm not going to go to it. Okay. I'm almost done here, I think. And we'll wrap this up right at about an hour and whatever. Okay. So I went through this. The Gentile fourth beast of Daniel, the latter-day iteration, is the same beast of John's revelation who makes war with the saints. The end of Ezra's eagle prophecy and the white horse prophecy counter this final Babylon and the prophecy of Joseph Smith saying that the Constitution will be saved from a thread and be restored to its original um, light and truth and covenant. Um, and if you don't know the white horse, I encourage you to read it. I'm not saying everything in it is, you know, 100% ago and that i understand it all but um it seems to fit like lock and key with everything else going on here okay this so this ezra's eagle prophecy the end of ezra's eagle prophecy and the white horse prophecy countered this final babylon with the return of the translated prophets and people of old and in ezra's eagle this um return of the ten tribes and there's a voice that speaks unto the nations and calls basically their sins it's, it's going to be like a third nephi moment where or a nephi moment where he's on his tower basically uh, prophesying of the evil wicked abominations and secret works that are happening in their government there locally that's going to be what's what happens when at the end of ezra's eagle prophecy here shortly i believe where there will be an angel proclaiming um the evil deeds of men and basically the judgment upon the american continent and the beginning of zion here in america I think this is the second coming um, for us in terms of Latter-day Saints. And people want to say, like, when do you think the second coming is going to happen? And everybody's like, oh, it's not going to happen for a long time because all that stuff in Jerusalem and the temple and this and that. And we're not in every country. And uh, I'm sorry, but according to scriptures, there are there is a cleansing of America and a Zion becoming America and being the wicked being cut off. So a judgment upon the saints, upon the church, upon my house, it will start first, right? That happens first. And everybody wants to look over that part and consider it like not a second coming. Yeah. It's not the moment where Jesus comes in his power and glory and literally burns um, everybody on the Mount of Olives. No, but there will be a burning here in America um, as the wicked are cleansed and purged from it. And the waters begin to recede and protect this continent from the rest of the earth. There will be a literal division, a polarity of the earth as catastrophic events unfold. And I don't think until then will we see these things happen. So don't get excited about uh, predicting years and things. Um, wait till you see cosmic things happening and then you'll be like, okay, it's happening. So Daniel continues. When the thrones are cast down, the footnote reads set up. Why? So when I, when you go to that and I'm reading in Daniel 7 verse uh, 9, it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down. You follow this footnote and it says actually that it means set up when the thrones are set up. And let me read what else I was saying here. Why? This is because the earthly thrones or kings in authority and power will be broken to pieces by the fourth beast in Adam. The heavenly thrones are brought down. Literally, I believe, space and heaven. Like they're heavenly thrones. Um, the throne of God is the congregation of planets in proper alignment to create a paradisical state, to create a celestial state even, um, if needed or if given the proper power. <laughs> And I don't think we'll, we're getting celestial power quite yet. It's a step up from what we're used to, kind of back to the days before the flood and a chias, uh, chiasmic type, uh, chiasmus type um, pattern where we're, we gotta, we, we're down in a celestial sphere. We need to up it one sphere first before we, after the millennium, go into the celestial sphere and have more power uh, bestowed upon us. So I believe the throne being set up here uh, is the throne of Adam on Diamond, the return of these planets that changed the top of this earth to a paradisical state 
um, before the whole earth is changed. And it's just like a cell in cell division and um, growth. It's a polar activity. There are, there's more activity in the poles of a cell because it's electrical, by the way, and this applies to the planet. Um, it, it forms a cap or a crown on the northern pole of a cell when division and, you know, you biology freaks and chemistry freaks will know this. But it, like as, as above, so below, as tiny, as big, as, as micro is macro. I believe those are all very valid um, philosophies to consider prophecy by and consider the language in the scriptures by, especially what's going on here in the last days. So these thrones are set up. I believe this is the returning of all these prophets, the returning of conditions to a paradisical state, a Zion-like state here in America. And this will be when Adam on Diamond is is performed and the keys to the kingdom are essentially passed over to Christ. And this is what this is. The Ancient of Days did sit, Adam, whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. This is all catastrophe planetary language of these planets returning. The same that Ezekiel's seeing, the same that Daniel's seeing here, the same that Ezra sees. Like, these are all contemporaries too, when you think about it. Daniel and Babylon and what's going on, they, they were like probably the same age as um, Nephi or Laman and Lemuel um, because it was about 600 BC when Babylon captured them and Daniel was in that captivity. It was around that time frame. So you got to think, like, these these people are seeing the same imagery um, and describing the same things. And I'm telling you, it's planets that descend down. It's just like Joseph Smith said, the last grand sign, the world will say it is a comet, a planet. It will be the the start of the falling of the stars from heaven to the earth. Okay. A fiery stream issued forth and came forth before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him. And 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. So those that are with us are more than those that be with them, them. The judgment seat was set and the books were opened. And I beheld because the voice of the great words which the horn spake. So the Antichrist is still there and he's speaking these words. I beheld till even the beast was slain. And his body destroyed and given to, over to the burning flames. So it's Adam that does. And it's funny because Adam, Michael, he shows up all the time to do battle with the devil. Uh, whether it's pre-existence where Michael and his angels, the archangel, goes and does battle and casts uh, Lucifer down. Or whether it's um, in Joel, Michael stands uh, in and protects uh, those from Satan. Or here in, um, later in Daniel, I don't know if it's Daniel 10 or 11, I believe, where Daniel sees Michael come down and intervene with Satan again. Um, or you have on the Susquehanna River, like we recently talked about this, where who, who's there to identify the devil masquerading as an angel in light? It's again, it's Michael. He comes down to deal with the devil. He's, he's the prince of jewels. Uh, he's the Lord's um, right-hand military man against his enemies. So it makes perfect sense in our scriptural world and in that context to see that it's Adam here casting judgment on the Americas and setting things up for Adam on Diamond and casting out the Antichrist, essentially. Um, okay. So let's apply the grand key of cosmism a bit. I've gone over uh, a bit about what I want to there. All ritual and symbols of kingship are derived. So we're talking about kingdoms. We're talking about kings. They operate on this ancient you know, law and rules of symbolism, of ritual, of um, control and power. And they're all derived from the stars or from heaven. This is why anciently they were worshipped and idolized. The idolatry is based in this instead of um, understanding that God and Christ is the ultimate you know, he's the word, he's the verb, he's the one who created and organized what we what we see. They attribute all that power to the heavenly bodies because of their size, because they're dom, you know, they're, well, just because of their apostasy, because they don't understand the true nature of spheres and, and who's controlling what and which ones, because size will deceive you in terms of a god versus a planet. Anyways, so, but all rights of kingship come from the stars or come from heaven, come from Saturn, ultimately. Saturn was the great king of heaven. Um, and... That's why all kingship rites afterwards were like a false priesthood. They tried to imitate what was before um, and tried to imitate being uh, like ascension. They knew that holy holy men ascended up to the kingdom, to the king of heaven. So I'm, I'm, um, I don't have enough of material right now in imagery and stuff to really elaborate on this and crystallize it the way that I want to. So I'll just kind of leave it at there. Just this is the root that I'm coming from, that ritual symbols of kingship are derived from the stars and from heaven or the ancient state of heaven, the paradise that it used to be, the paradise lost, right? There, it's, it's trying to go back to that when Adam sat on the throne. They imitate, and, and so when Adam comes, I think that's ironic, right? He's the, he's the king and the one to smash these worldly kingdoms imitating his style. He's like, y'all cramping my style. You're not doing it right. They imitate and reflect the royalty of heaven, the movement of celestial bodies that were once close to the earth during the golden patriarchal age. So, what are kingly thrones cosmically symbol of? And I kind of already whiffed on this, so we'll just read this straight through. 
They are symbolic of the cosmic mountain, the axis mundi, the configuration of planets as they were seated, fixed, and immovable in the north. The earth as the footstool or the base of the figure, because we are at the bottom looking up. And so this is why there's language in the scriptures of the earth being the footstool, and we'll read them next. But let's read these first. This is an interesting symbol called the, the I don't know how to pronounce it, surul, kurul seat, but uh, two pairs of bronze legs belonging to the sele kurulis, preserved in the Museum of Naples. Um, but the surul, surul, kurul, I don't know how to say it. You're going to have to watch the video and see it. C-U-R-U-L-E. Kurul seat is the design of chair noted for its uses in ancient Rome, the Europe uh, and Europe through the 20th century. It's sta- at status in early Rome as a symbol of political or military power carried over the, uh, to other civilizations, as it was also utilized in this regard by the kings of Europe, Napoleon and others, blah, blah, blah. But when you see this, uh, <laughs> this figure, when you're looking at it, you've got the crescents here, you've got the horns up, you've got this, the planets in the middle. Um, it's kind of a mini archetype of the polar configuration, but it's it's to represent this uh, footstool of the earth and dominion over the earth. Here's Isis with the throne of God. It looks like a giant footstool kind of thing where it's got the throne and then a footstool at the bottom. And again, you have a throne of ancient Egypt. This is, uh, again, same depiction with a footstool. Again, you're on a, uh, on a foundation stone or a footstool. I'm just showing pictures. So those of you who are just listening. All right, moving on. So read these. Do you see the pattern? These are the scriptures about footstools. So all I did was search footstool, right, in your scriptures. And you can find all the scriptures that have this cosmic language about a footstool and a lot of times in relation to Adam and his coming. So it's kind of interesting, right? Where you have uh, Moses 6 in the Pearl of Great Price, in verse 5 starting. And a book of remembrance was kept, and in which was recorded in the language of Adam, Adamic. For it was given unto as many as called upon God to write by the spirit of inspiration. And by them their children were taught to read and write, having a language pure and undefiled. Now the same priesthood which was in the beginning shall be in the end of the world also. Now, this is prophecy Adam spake as he was moved upon by the Holy Ghost. Now, this prophecy Adam spake as he was moved upon by the Holy Ghost, and a genealogy was kept of his children of God. All right, I shouldn't have read that, but I did. Um, Okay, verse 9 is the one we want. In the image of his own body, male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day that they were created, and became a living souls in the land upon the footstool of God. Wow, so the footstool of God being synonymous with the earth, um, talking about creation and how they were placed there in that state when the planets were still together, it would have been perfect symbolism to call it the throne or having them being placed on the footstool. Uh, Isaiah 66, uh, verse 1, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? Right? Our temples are um, essentially like the footstool of the Lord. For They're symbolic of the connecting portion of the earth to the connecting of heaven, as above, so below. The bringing the temple from below meeting the temple from above. Next scripture, First Nephi 17. And he raiseth up a righteous nation, and destroyeth the nations of the wicked. And he leadeth away the righteous into precious lands, and the wicked he destroyeth, and curseth the land unto them for their sakes. He ruleth high in the heavens, for it is his throne, and his earth is his footstool. Again, we have heaven as the throne and earth as the footstool. Third Nephi chapter 12. So this is the Lord himself when he comes and he's explaining to the Nephites. But verily, verily, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Interesting. Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither shalt thou swear by the head, because thou canst not make one hair black or white. Okay. So there we have again, scriptures uh, showing the earth is the footstool. And in this context of this planetary configuration where the earth is, um, at the base of it, at the bottom, we're at the bottom looking up. Makes sense. Because it looked like a giant man standing on the earth. A heaven man. Atlas. Son of man is what it was called. And that's why Christ calls himself and refers to himself. I am the son of man. I'm the one who put it there. I'm, I'm the leader of everything. I put this together. I'm the one you should worship. That thing there was to remind you of me. And to, my promise to come down and redeem you. And bring you back up to heaven. So, now, let me qualify that the Ancient of Days is Adam. If that wasn't already self-explanatory, you haven't read the scripture yourself. That's, it's in our Doctrine and Covenants. Daniel is describing the return of the resurrected Adam, who will be the seventh angel, uh, to come with planetary vials and pour out judgment upon the earth, and again, to establish the throne. So Doctrine and Covenants section 138 is where it says, uh, Father Adam, the Ancient of Days, and Father of All. Where's the other scripture? Doctrine and Covenants 27, where it says in verse 11, and also with Michael, or Adam, the Father of All, the Prince of All, the Ancient of Days. In Revelation, verse 1, um, it is the description of Adam, Son of man, or no, this is the, the scripture of the Lord, but he's described the same as Adam, right? As a resurrected being. There's a reason why they're both described the same. 
By one man, the entire earth fell. By another, they were redeemed. The two sons of God, Adam and Christ. Okay, so we have uh, Daniel 7. I think I'm just going over here um, the description of Adam, which I won't go into anymore. Okay, so notice how Adam, the Ancient of Days, is described in the same way as the resurrected Lord in John's revelation. Daniel will also see the Lord taking the, the keys from Adam, who sets up the kingdom and the throne of God. So let's move on to the wheel and fire aspect of the throne. I thought I was almost done here. I guess not. So in verses 9 through 10, we have a throne was like a fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire and a fiery stream issued forth and came before him. These are all cosmic phenomena and follow the divine laws as truth uh, of truth as planets congregate and move in close proximity. So here's a, a depiction of the wheel throne of God, of Yahweh. Um, weird how he's got a wheel there, you know? It's like a giant wheelchair is how they imagined it. <laughs> but essentially, just imagine planet. Like, he's coming in planets, and these symbols around it are the plasma formations and things that happen, and all the creations in heaven that are with him, That his entourage, right? It's going to be all kinds of creatures that worship him and follow him around. Um, here's another one. This is a Yahweh's wheel throne. It's got wings on it. Now here's Aztec throne. You've got the same structure and the two pillars, Jachim Boaz, the stairs, the Jacob's ladder going up, and then the, the wheels at the top, the planets that were fixed in the north, the ancient sun, Kolob. And this is why in in Pearl of Great Price and Kolob's described in the, in the facsimile too and things as concentric planets or planets that are governing one another in in time. Like some move at the same rate because they were rotating, Jupiter and Saturn were rotating about the same because they're similar bodies. And symbolic of Adam and Christ, actually. So it's kind of interesting. You have Saturn as Adam and, and Jupiter as Christ. And um, anyways, I digress. Here's another wheel. This is out in India. Same idea, concept, and application. They applied it to the sun, and it was immovable, and it stood in the north, and it gave life, and it did this, and blah, blah, blah. And when the flood happened, it was because of that thing, right? Like, th there's so much over, uh, it's an overabundance of evidence, but nobody will just look at it. Nobody will see it all as it is. And it's hard because I want to and I want to show them everybody, but I sound like some schizophrenic crazy person just posting random images and saying, look, look. But that's really what it is. So wheels of burning fire and a throne of fiery flame. These are the rotating planets in their glory or illuminated by interplanetary plasma. Fire is plasma. So when the planets are brought together, rolled together like a scroll, they create wheel and spoke plasma formations. And here's some depictions of that. We have a pillar and a wheel. That's in uh, India. I think that one's also in India, but a pillar and a wheel, planets, and even in our modern day Christian depictions of the second coming, um, this is exactly, you know, the four and 20 elders and everybody's surrounding the throne. Look at the throne. It's in the same alpha, omega, pillar, God, sun, God um, formation. And you've got the fire and flames of uh, plasma discharge all around, lightning. Uh, same thing. These mandalas are uh, the four quarters of heaven, four quarters of earth. It's an electromagnetic uh, phenomena, and we imitate it in the building of holy cities. Even the New Jerusalem and everything, when you look at them, I have a whole thread on this, that the holy cities were built after this pattern because it was seen in heaven anciently. And so they tried to build again as above, so below. As they, their kingship rights and everything imitated the planets and their movements, so did their building of their cities imitate the uh, Shambhala of heaven or the Zion of heaven. Okay, consider plasma discharge in a, in a laboratory or in a plasma ball. Now scale it up to the planetary bodies, right? We're talking large amounts of power that are kind of unfathomable until it will start to happen. And then we too, like those in the Book of Mormon writing, will say, wow, thunderstorms like we'd never seen before. Massive bolts of lightning and thunders that crack the earth and shake it. Like, it's not just that, but the um, earthquakes and volcanoes and everything else, they're all electromagnetic. So when these storms happen, all of those things are going to be going off. It's all, gonna, it's all connected to, um, to the hosts of heaven. Um, now the aurora are visible plasma discharges in our upper atmosphere. Do the, okay, you guys know this. I'm beating dead horses here. Um, there's some pictures. Moving on. This is verifiable as you see the cosmic pattern through all ancient religion, symbology, and rock art. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the true... I should, I should have capitalized Christ there, Rip. Uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the true one story of the world. Every continent displays echoes of what was once taught by Adam to his posterity, but it has been confused by time and apostasy and diffusion of knowledge, like the game of telephone. That's exactly what you have across all seven continents. You have seven diverse apostate versions of the true cosmology of heaven, of, of Kolob, of the planets. We're not weird. We're the ones that know the truth, okay? Everybody else can call us whatever they want and make fun of us for our doctrines and our celestial laws and exaltation, but they're way behind the curve in understanding everything that's going on. So here's uh, Krishna, and you've got multiple arms, kind of like the plasma discharges, the fire around the ring. Um, and, and a throne at the bottom. And the lotus flower, too, is the flower of life. All civilizations derived from this polar axis, this axis mundi. 
even ancient Atlantis and everything like this is this all this all ties in and it can be made sense of I'm getting tired so I'm gonna have to get through these now the fiery stream that issues forth is the plasma column or pillar of fire that descends from the planets as they realign to the earth during the tribulation and judgment that quickly approaches this was witnessed in various phases and uh, ways in the past so it doesn't have to just be in this ancient polar configuration for example when the Israelites were um, saved from Egypt and the waters of the Red Sea parted and there was a pillar of fire that led them, right? Like this is the same thing and it can happen on a smaller scale if a heavenly body is passing um, through, like something moon-sized, right? Or even smaller. What if there was a planet moon-sized that came through, docked to the earth and literally led the Israelites through and, and around and caused terror to all the kingdoms around because they recognized what it was. It was planetary catastrophe and they were amazed and astonished that there was this group of people that the planet and the gods and the angels were favoring. Um, and so it put fear in all the nations. Anyways, moving on. You can also find this planetary archetype everywhere. All seven continents. I've said that a million times. Consider the Mayan calendar central figure with a protruding tongue, right? Right here, same thing. This is the central planetary figure. And then when you look at these symbols, again, outside ring is all fire. It's called celestial fire. And you get the four quarters of the earth. All right, now here's some um, totem poles from island tradition and things like that, right? Where you have the protruding tongue of the warlike figure. Or think of the haka right they're sticking out their tongues and shouting and making loud noise and unison and dancing and doing ritual war moves right there's always ritual involved in war like when you really look at it it's it's so amazing that i'm not making this up it's not me being original and i'm no smarty pants or anything i just have a, a desire to connect the dots and when you do in a faithful manner and using the priesthood and the scriptures and following the prophets and not stepping those bounds then the lord answers and I don't know everything. I'm just starting on this journey and I'm sharing because I want more help. I need people with other expertises and interests um, that aren't just interdisciplinary grifters like me uh, to go deep into some of these things and really extract some great symbolisms that I'm not seeing or, or I'm incapable of seeing. Like that's the whole reason for sharing. I know that everybody has something to add. Um, and I'm just trying to lay like a generic framework to say, look, this stuff's there. We should look at it with this eye single to the glory of God. These represent the same fiery streams that Daniel is describing coming from Adam's throne. Or in other words, they're describing the anointing of the earth in light, power, and glory, and to the destruction of the wicked, to the quickening of the righteous, the pouring out of spirit. I've got several images here that kind of depict um, this occurrence where you've got Medusa with the snakes in her hair turning things to stone. Oh, well, that's also a petrification is also something that happens during plasma events. So why would Medusa, who's also associated with Venus, who may have had some planetary encounters with the earth, right, as a winged serpent or a dragon, um, have those type of characteristics, right? Well, when you understand plasma, electric universe type physics and stuff or alternative physics, then the puzzle really starts to come together. And this physics is what they're suppressing. They don't want it to come out because it would basically liberate us energy-wise from the global banking system and their, their control and their war powers too. Uh, I assume all of their technologies for war and domination are built um, way ahead of us in, in these types of physics. Um, anyways, yeah, you have the same patterns in the facsimile too, and I could go into detail, and I will at some other point, not now, about facsimile too and this. Okay. Here's a powerful recreation for better, better context, and I'm not going to play that well. Maybe I'll play it here for the video. So those of you listening, I'm sorry, but you might hear it. I'm going to fast forward, but it shows Mars descending and coming closer to the Earth in the different plasma formations. All right, find that video. You can all watch that on your own. So now, with the same worshiping thousands and the judgment spoken of, it's also all th those same things that, that are mentioned in Daniel 7 um, around the coming of Adam and the setting up of this throne. They're also spoken of in John's Revelation where he's seeing the same thing. Um, I'm not going to read through these. Well, all right, I'm going to put them up on the screen again just to document because that's the main purpose of this, and I keep getting away from that. So I had these scriptures, Daniel 7. I had Revelation 11, and I guess verse 18 is the one I highlighted, the time of the dead. They should be judged. Yeah, there will be a giant resurrection too at, at these events like we need to be ready for that. You can't be surprised for when you start seeing dead people rising again and some strange things happening because all of this will gradually, um, I think, overtake us quickly. <laughs> gradually, quickly, I know. But that's how the, he says, not with haste, with haste. Or, you know, it's there is nuance in these things, and I hate to admit that, but it's true, that you've got to be wise. And then I also had Doctrine and Covenants 88 here where it highlights Michael as the seventh angel um, and bringing the host of heaven. 
And again, I always refer, when I hear hosts, yes, it can be a, a group of people, it can be armies, actual soldiers and angels, um, but also the hosts are the planets. Like we are literally small things being hosted on a bigger thing. Okay, the earth will literally roll over on its side. This is an important part later for cosmic things, this concept of the earth rolling over on its side so that the American continent will once again, and specifically Adam on Diamond in Missouri in that area, will be the North Pole of the entire planet. Um, it won't be the North Pole that we see now up in the Arctic. It will roll. Things, things are really going to change, and this will be the main division. This will be when the Antichrist is chased out of America and the waters begin to recede up to the north. The return of the Ten Tribes is happening at this point. Um, a lot of stuff will be going on, and it'll be obvious. Like This isn't something that will sneak up... Um, and you'll have to ask, like, is this happening? No, this, you'll know, everyone will know. The waters will recede to the north and the islands will be as one continent again. And I have scriptures that speak to this. Um, here's a scripture in one sec, uh, section 116 that talks about Adam on Diamond, the place where Adam shall visit his people and will sit as spoken of by Daniel. So that's tying that scripture directly to this prophecy of Daniel in the last days. And here we have section 133. And he shall command the great deep. And I consider the great deep, not just the oceans, but space as well. Space is the great deep, great beyond. And when you know plasma physics or you I, you apply plasma physics to outer space, it is just water. It is the, what is the firmament, but our atmosphere that separates the water of heaven from the water of uh, the atmosphere we're drinking and swimming through right now, the, the ether um, at the densities that we have here close to the earth. So he shall command the great deep and it shall be driven back to the north countries. So here he is talking about the oceans and the water. And I would say the planets and space and everything, again, um, being as it was before. A restoration of all things, a true restitution of all things. And and the islands shall become one land. So it's not Pangea, but I believe when um, you have this planetary catastrophe come, well, the valleys will be made low. and every, Like the earth will get resurfaced, essentially. It'll be a resurfacing event. Um, but not in, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. And the land of Jerusalem and the land of Zion shall be turned back to their own place shall be turned back to their own place right we know that the garden of eden by revelation was here on the american continent if that's so then this had to have been the northern pole during the time that adam and eve walked the earth or that adam was on the earth so it would make sense that when adam returns with his throne and to set up adam on diamond that he would right side up the earth right there are hopi prophecies that talk about this as well the blue uh, what is it the blue kachina and the red kachina that come to right the earth they come to to straighten the earth to its proper alignment. Like I'm not making this up. I'm not. I'm not. I wish I was because it would be kind of a cool story just to riff and make fun of. But no, these are all things that are real that you can look into. Um, so it, it shall be turned back. Um, Zion shall be turned back to her own place, and the earth shall be like as it was in the days before it was divided. Exactly saying what I'm saying. Not just the land divided, but I, I believe the division of the earth was not just the continents shifting or the geopolitical divisions of the people in the seven continents, um, but because I don't believe in continental drift for one, but for two, because also there was a dividing of planets, a falling away of different planetary spheres at different times uh, so they could fall into their current orbits that you see now around the sun, the, the new sun. This is new dad. Uh, da, 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 da. And then the Lord comes and the barren deserts and then all this catastrophic language where it talks about those who come from the north, the 10, this is talking about the 10 tribes returning from the north countries, smiting the rocks, the ice shall flow down at their presence, highway shall be cast up in the midst of the great deep. Again, here we have this amazing parting of the waters as there's catastrophe happening and our brethren returning with great power. This is not something I'm making up, right? And it's not something that we talk about a lot in church because I don't think people understand it. And I wouldn't understand this at all. Um, I would be in the same boat as most people without the cosmic piece that kind of anchors what I'm what I'm seeing visually in my head. Continuing in Daniel 7, Daniel pauses his vision to revisit what happened to the other beast kingdoms of the world um, as the as the earth is divided into two because there is this polarization that happens. And this is the same polarization that we see in Nephi and that John elaborates on as well, where you have Babylon and Zion essentially taking over um, the kingdoms of the earth, where you have the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the Antichrist and devil. Um, these dueling kingdoms, and this will all happen as the physical changes to the earth begin. Zion in the north, American continent, with pla planets creating a veil of plasma, right? A veil of plasma. I'm going to say that three times. A veil of plasma, and only those who have proper covenants and ordinances and know how to get through the veil are going to be able to go up to the north, to Zion. Light and eternal life, and maybe who's going to be guarding those pearly gates, right? Is it Peter and James and John and those returning? Maybe. 
All right. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> and so here's what the Lord says to him. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their own dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So again, they were just kind of wrapped under this fourth beast kingdom rule in the latter days. Oh man, I got a lot of crap here. I don't want to read all this. I've been going for two hours. All right. Daniel then sees the resurrected Jesus Christ return to Adam on Diamond and received the keys of all dispensations and the dominion of the kingdom that was set up by his delegates on earth, as well as by his delegates in heaven. Adam and all who return. Okay. I'm not going to read the rest of these scriptures. I'm going to flash them on the screen here. Again, you can pause these and read them. They are from the Doctrine and Covenant Student Manual, Institute Manual, quotes from Joseph Fielding Smith, um, just quotes from others, uh, Bruce R. McConkie, quotes from the Deseret News and Lorenzo Snow and others about Adam on Diamond. So I highly recommend everybody read them because they also tie in a lot of these clues that I'm talking about where things and earth changes that will happen um, in preparation for the millennium. It's not just going to be this magical snap of fingers, guys, that all this happens. We're going to see it all take place. There will be have to be a physical changes to the earth, temporal changes that take place, and that means the kingdoms of the earth as well. A couple more quotes that I like, one from Elder McConkie and one from Elder Millet. So I'll put these up on the screen. Again, pause and read, screen grab or whatever. And here's the next one from Dr. Millet. Okay. At this point, Daniel 7, from verses 15 to 28, the angel who is present with Daniel during his dream begins to provide the interpretation as Daniel inquires. And we read about this in section 50, right? How many times do we see the prophets live up to that example where you get a dream, a vision, and they immediately ask and receive the interpretation? Just like Nephi and other recorded visions, I will be brief and wrap this part up. I'll be brief, right? And wrap this part up. Uh, okay. He first explains that the beast, uh, beasts represent earthly kingdoms. A thousand foot view from the angel after Daniel has witnessed it all is in verse 18, where he basically says, God wins. He says, uh, but the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. <laughs> and the government shall be upon his shoulders, as we sing in Handel's Messiah and in Isaiah. Finally, Daniel desires to know about the fourth beast kingdom in more detail. The angel explains the same as we have already discussed in this thread a bit. Uh, the diverse horn is the Antichrist. Obviously, I'm not trying to be exhaustive in uh, teaching you about the Antichrist or anything like that. Um, everybody should ask their own questions and do your own studies on these things. Try and find all the passages where the Antichrist is elaborated on. In fact, in Daniel and later chapters, he speaks much more to the Antichrist and the fourth beast kingdom and other things. Um, Joel talks about him. Um, talk, these, these things are mentioned in Malachi. Like all, all the Old Testament prophets that we ignore and kind of skip over, um, when you put them into this context and you understand these things as they're playing out right now in real life, potentially, and I believe it with my heart, like this is happening, that we're watching these beast kingdoms change and the governments are about to flip upside down. Um, it's exciting. And I have desires to feast upon the scriptures always. So this concludes my exploration of Daniel's vision in chapter 7. I testify that Jesus is the Christ. He is the cosmic Messiah. He's the redeemer of the earth and he is even at our door. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is his kingdom in preparation here on earth. Um, it is the rock cut forth without hands rolling to demolish these kingdoms of the earth, we will stand up and be a thorn in their sides, not to be, um, not to be overtaken though. We will be smitten. And I hope you're ready for that. I know that president Nelson is a prophet of God. And I know that the book of Mormon is true. I know that we must go up the ladder of knowledge the proper way. You've got to study the scriptures. You can't jump into speculating on these things of prophecy. If you don't have the spirit of prophecy, if you haven't studied prophecy in general, do you know where, where you know, which prophetic books you need to be reading? Do you know what's said in Ezekiel and what said in the book of Revelation? Do you understand these things just even superficially? Have them in your mind present and ask for the gift of prophecy and seek in faith. Don't doubt. The Lord answers. He answers me all the time. And I have lots of questions still more about all of this, and I'm excited to be a part of it here. But I'm going to leave this with you guys. This will be it. I'm going to wrap it up. A little picture of Daniel in the lion's den to end here. And love you guys very much. Catch me next time. We'll talk about Ezra's eagle. And I'll go more into the esoteric uh, mysticism, like the Freemasonry, the, the secret societies and stuff that helped in the founding of America and their alternate plan or destiny for America that seems to be coming to a head right now. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about that and uh, some other things. I also have recorded my first episode of my podcast. I'm going to do a few more before I start to release them. And um, the first few episodes are going to be really foundational, kind of explaining my just overall paradigm and philosophy on integrating information. 
and I think it's key and vital. It's going to be maybe boring for some of you, so sorry. But after that, I'm going to bring in a friend, and we will kind of banter back and forth about cosmism, about Velikovsky, about the electric universe, about planets, about history, about symbols, about secret combinations, and the things that you see and hear me post and talk about in my music. We'll go through my music's uh, my music as well, my lyrics, and uh, kind of point out some of the um, important nuggets that I'd like to give to people. So that'll be part of my podcast coming up. But it's underway. Um, Sorry it's taken so long. I'm mortal. I'm human. I'm not perfect. I love you guys. Peace out.